Okay, I see you, Councillor Mejia. Oh, I don't have permissions to bump you up, though. Could someone let Councillor Mejia in, please? Okay, are we ready to go, Carrie? Yep, ready to go when you are. Wonderful. Councilor Braden, are you ready to go? We'll wait one minute for our lead sponsor here. Uh oh, um, Carrie, I'm getting a note from Councilor Braden that she's she's unable to access the microphone. Let me see if there's okay. I'm going to try clicking ask to unmute. Liz, does that work? Yep, that's good. There we go. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's just dive in. Is that work, Councilor Braden? Is there anyone else you're waiting for? Pardon? You ready to jump in, or anyone yes, else? Yes, ready to jump in. Okay, wonderful. Uh, could you make me a co a panel um, a co host so that I can see who's in the in the waiting room? Would that be possible? Carrie, could you help? I do, I don't have those permissions. Oh, okay. I think it's all set. Okay, let's jump in then. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Boston City Council's hearing within the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Uh, my name is Michelle Wu. I'm chair of this committee. And I'm pleased to introduce today's hearing on docket number 0214, which has been sponsored by uh, Councillor Liz Braden in order for a hearing regarding an Alston Brighton Master Plan and Zoning Initiative. I will read a lot of language into the record, and then we will dive in with statements from counselors and then over to our panelists. So good morning. In accordance with Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirements that public bodies conduct their meetings in a pla public place that's open and physically accessible to the public, the city council will be conducting this hearing virtually. This enables the council to carry out our responsibilities while adhering to public health recommendations and ensuring public access to deliberations through adequate alternative means. This public hearing is being recorded and live streamed on the City of Boston's website. It will also be rebroadcast at a later date on Xfinity 8. Oops. Uh, RCN 82 and Fios 964. Anyone who would like to testify on this matter, please email juan.lopez at boston.gov for the Zoom link. Again, uh, today's hearing is docket number 0214, order for a hearing regarding an Alston Brighton Master Plan and Zoning Initiative, sponsored by Councillor Liz Braden and referred to the committee on January 27, 2021. I'm joined by my colleagues, the lead sponsor, Councillor Braden, uh, Councillor Ed Flynn, and Councillor Julia Mejia so far. Um, I am sure others will join us and we will recognize them as they, um, as they come in. And so uh, we have many panelists today uh, from administration and BPDA representatives to community members and leaders of civic associations and other organizations in, in the community. So we'll dive right in, first offering uh, colleagues a chance to give a brief opening statement. Uh-oh, I see Councillor Braden has dropped off. Let me see. Oh, 
Let me just add her back in. Okay, uh, Councillor Braden, opening statements. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to my fellow colleagues for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank um, the uh, BPDA. Uh, trans uh, I've, this has been a change in the lineup, so I want to thank all the folks from the administration for joining us this morning for this very important conversation about um, Alston, the future of Alston Brighton. I also want to thank all the panelists and members of the public who have taken time to offer testimony and comments. But last but not least, I want to thank the central staff who work behind the scenes so diligently to make all this happen on a regular basis. My staff at uh, District 9 staff and, and, and your staff, Councillor Wu, uh, for shepherding us through this process. Um, I really feel this is an important day for Alston Brighton. Over many years, we have attended community meetings regarding new developments in, in the neighbourhood, and we've heard repeated calls for a plan a plan that would take into account the impacts of seemingly unbridled development on the quality of life, liv livability, diversity, long-term stability, and social cohesion of our neighborhood that we call home. Adding huge numbers of housing units that are unaffordable for most of our residents, units that were predominantly studio and one bedrooms with only a small percentage of family size units. All this has resulted in a decrease in home ownership, a displacement of working families, artists and retirees who cannot afford to live in our neighborhood any, anymore. Alston Brighton is the second largest neighborhood in Boston with an area of 4.4 square miles and a population of over 75,000 people. It is home to three universities and two hospitals. Over the last 10 years, we have, we have seen an excess of 13 million square feet of new construction and that was being facilitated by project by project spot zoning driven by developers. We have 7,000 new housing units already constructed and another 3,000 under review in the pipeline. This is just the beginning of what we anticipate as we anticipate the creation of a whole new neighbourhood in Lower Alston, north of the Pike. It is alarming to residents of their, that their community is being considered as the next Kendall Square with no plan to place uh, in place to ensure that this new neighbourhood will be affordable and inclusive for all Bostonians. It is almost incomprehensible that this scale of development is happening in a district that has never, it has never had a comprehensive district-wide master plan. We are asking for a comprehensive master plan in an effort to avoid the mistakes that we have seen in other parts of the city. We want to ensure that future development in Alston Brighton is community driven, people focused and equitable so that we will have an economically and demographically diverse, inclusive, resilient and sustainable community for all. This it will not happen without intentionality and a vision. And that is why we need a community informed master plan for Alston Brighton. I really look forward to hearing from the panelists today and I thank everyone for their participation in this beginning of a very important conversation about the future of Alston Brighton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wu. Um, I'll be very brief. I just here to learn more about um, the proposed plan and uh, listen to the advocates, but also to support my colleague, Council Braden, and her tremendous work on this issue. Um, thank you, Council Wu, and um, thank you, Council Braden. No further comments. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Councilor Mejia. Thank you, Councilor Wu. I was waiting for Councilor Flynn to put a little bit of fire in his speech. What happened, Flynn? Um, I need you to step it up, okay? Um, but uh, seriously, um, thank you so much uh, for hosting this hearing, to the chair and to the sponsor for calling this hearing. Austin and Brighton is an amazing neighborhood. It's a gathering ground for people from all different kinds of ages, economic statuses, languages, and nationalities. In fact, two of our office staffers call Austin and Brighton home. 
Our office recently filed a hearing order in collaboration with a number of Austin and Brighton residents, thanks to Tony, Jenna, Barbara, and Jane, um, to address the role that civic voices play in our planning and development process. We filed this that hearing order because we've heard from residents across the city how the community development process doesn't really center community. And it's not just about development, it's about all affordable development. We talk about homeowners versus renters all day, but if our low-income residents don't have a place to live, we're in trouble. We have a responsibility in Austin and Brighton and in every neighborhood to ensure that we're fighting for housing for low-income residents, renters, artists, unhoused people, everyone. And I just want to give a real big shout out to Councilor Breeden for bringing this uh, to, to the space. I know that she calls it home um, and she goes really hard all day, every day when it comes to the development process in Austin and Brighton. So thank you, Councilor Breeden, for your leadership in that space. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Okay, we're going to dive in now with the panel. Let me just make sure that we're um, getting the right panelists here. Tim Davis, Vineet, Mira, okay. Dana. There's a lot of lot of folks ready to testify, which is very, very exciting. I'm just trying to sort through to make sure. Oh, okay, I see more friends. Okay, did I get everyone from the administration and BPDA? Uh, and then Councilor uh, Lauren Shirtliff is in there as well. Hi, Lauren. Okay. Oh, here's Lauren, got it. All right, thank you, Neil. Great, thanks. Okay, over to you all. Lauren, would you like to start or Vinny? I'm not sure who's, uh, what the batting order is, but feel free to dive in. Please introduce yourself, give your statement, and um, then we'll go to questions from counselors. Uh, Vinny, I'll go ahead first if that makes sense. So hi everybody, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Lauren Shirtleff. I am the BPDA's Director of Planning, um, here to just give a, a brief kind of overview of our planning efforts in Alston Brighton. Um, in the past decade, we've had several different efforts of different scales um, in different parts of the neighborhood. Uh, one of the most significant, and probably the most significant, has been the Brighton Guest Street Planning Study. We also uh, launched the North Alston Brighton Community Wide Plan. We've held institutional master plan efforts. Uh, for all of the uh, colleges and universities in the area, which are primarily BC, BU, and Harvard. And we've been working very closely with the state on the future alignment of I-90. The two more recent efforts um, that we've been leading in the last couple of years uh, include the Western Avenue Corridor Study and Rezoning. That one kicked off in fall of 2019, and we're hoping to wrap that up this summer. The goal there is to update the zoning and bring it into alignment with current community goals and therefore guide development. Last week, uh, we actually had a great meeting where we presented our draft framework and I think it was very well received and we got some really good feedback. So we're looking forward to moving ahead with that one. Um, next week, we actually have a transportation focused meeting on April 13th. Um, separately, we also have the Alston Brighton Mobility Study, which is underway right now as well. That began in fall of 2018. We're hoping to wrap that one up in the next month or two. Um, and that was really a whole neighborhood-wide uh, effort. Its key recommendations will include the further build-out of the transit network, completion of the bike network, increasing of uh, walkability, enhancing our main streets and neighborhood street experience, and simplifying intersections for all users. Um, we've also started to look uh, and having conversations with Council Breeden and on trying to figure out where the next areas um, that we should be planning in Alston Brighton include. Uh, there are definitely some areas where we notice that there is enhanced development pressure and we'd like to get ahead of that. Um, but mainly, other than that, um, I'm here to listen. Uh, I'm anxious to hear from all of the advocates and community members who might be here and um, you know participate as we move forward and figure out how we can uh, continue to plan for the future of Alston Brighton. Thank you. Thank you. Feel free, um, Vinny, Tim, Tad, anyone else to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say a few words and then hand it over to Tad. So I'm the director of planning at the Boston Transportation Department. And I, I just want to uh, 
to say two things. One is that the transportation department has been working hand in hand with the BPDA uh, over the last several years, particularly focused on the Austin Brighton Mobility Plan that uh, BPDA staff is leading. And uh, we've been extremely, the second thing I wanted to say was that the community process for the Austin Brighton Mobility Plan has been extremely robust and has been really uh, informed by, uh, by local residents as well as advocates in a very healthy manner. And we hope that their recommendations, uh, that the recommendations of the plan uh, reflect their input. Uh, the transportation department itself, uh, we will focus on trying to identify projects that can be implemented in the short term, as well as identify those projects that will need a longer time frame uh, to be designed and uh, implemented. So I'm, I'm here to answer any questions, but I'll leave, hand it over to Tad, who's really been kind of the lead planner from the transportation perspective. Uh, for us. Thank you so much for the BPDA and the Transportation Department. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Ted Reed. I'm Deputy Director for Transportation and Infrastructure Planning at the BPDA. Um, Councillor Wu, Councillor Breeden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Finn, thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm really here to listen. Uh, uh, just to um, reinforce what Lauren said, we've been working on the AB mobility study for um, just over two years. Um, we've had a robust planning process. It is a neighborhood-wide plan for Alston and Brighton. We are hoping to wrap that plan up and take it to our board um, in May. Um, the plan we developed the plan in response to concerns from the community about um, the pace of new development and the ability of existing infrastructure to keep up with that development. So the plan does present a wide array of recommendations um, to, um, to expand transit opportunities, biking opportunities, walking opportunities, um, and make the infrastructure for, for um, motor vehicles um, more efficient as well. Again, I'm here just to listen today, and I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tim, would you like to add anything? Oh, you're muted, Tim. Um, uh, Tim Davis from the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, I think the, the master planning activities are largely, uh, you know, led by the BPDA, but d, d is, of course, always interested in these plans and how affordable housing will be incorporated to them. So we're uh, obviously here today to listen and if there's any questions specifically for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's dive into questions. Councilor Braden. Madam Chair, in the interest of, um, of time, I really feel that we, we could maybe go to the panelists and, and um, hear from them and then round up with questions at the end of that and, and bring it all sort of tied in together, if that's okay. Wonderful. Um, could I double check with these panelists? Um, if anyone has a time constraint, could you please let me know? You okay? Okay, wonderful. Um, so let me just cross-reference the panelist list with others. And Councillor Braden, feel free to go in and admit. I think, um, Jason Desrosier was the first person up, I think. Okay. Oh, this will be so helpful if you read the, off the names and I'll, I'll search for people and, and add them to the room. Yeah. Who, who else, Councillor Braden? Let's run through. Uh, Nat Natalicia Tracy from the Brazilian Workers' Centre and Joanne Barber, Executive Director of Charles U Inc. Okay, I don't see Natalicia on yet, but Joanne is here. Great. Anyone else? Um, that's the first. That's the first panel uh, from the community, and then the next one is Nick Greco and Scott Matlin. Okay. Um, we could probably put those all in together. I don't know. <laughs> Who else is here? Um, yes, Natalie is going to join at eleven, so she's um, she's coming in later. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, before we dive in, I'd like to recognize that our colleague, Councillor 
Michael Flaherty uh, at large has joined us as well. Councillor Flaherty, would you like to make a statement before we go to the community panel? Thank you, um, Madam Chair, uh, for hosting and obviously uh, to our colleague, Councillor Graydon, for filing uh, this uh, important hearing order. Uh, rezoning uh, is one of the most important things we can do as a city uh, to combat uh, overdevelopment uh, and uh, to make sure that uh, you know we move forward in a responsible, uh, well thought out way that benefits uh, all of our neighborhoods uh, as well as uh, their long-term residents. The, the rezoning effort in my hometown of South Boston was key to slowing down some of the uh, over-the-top um, uh, all-out projects that uh, have, um, you know, that uh, have been having, uh, you know, uh, significant impacts on the neighborhood's quality of life. And so, uh, you know, while I uh, had a front row seat and we served as sort of the first wave uh, of major development uh, that the city has seen, we're now seeing that development spread uh, throughout all of the neighborhoods of Boston, East Boston, Dorchester, and of course, Alston Brighton, the uh, district of our uh, our colleague and lead sponsor here, uh, Council Brighton. So the more we can do to, to stay ahead of it um, and develop new zoning regulations through a our community process, the better off everyone will be. Um, so I look forward to the hearing, uh, uh, see what the panelists have to say, as well as what steps uh, need to be taken uh, to move um, the Alston Brighton master plan forward and look forward uh, to continued partnership with Council Braden and my at-large colleagues to help her uh, make that a reality for the great uh, people of Alston Brighton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Okay, I will read down the list. I also just admitted the the um, three folks from the fourth panel as well. So we'll get everyone in and then we can do questions and then we'll open it up to public testimony as there's still a lot of folks um, on the list for that in addition. Okay, um, so we'll start with Jason and Joanne. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Alston Brighton is on the precipice of major transformation over the next few years, and we need to take this opportunity to be proactive rather than reactive and plan for the future we want for the neighborhood. In recent years, Alston Brighton has become the new hot neighborhood for development with between 2,400 and 3,000 units currently under review by the BPDA. And that range is there because um, as projects go through the um, Article 80 process, some of the numbers go down, some of the numbers you know, stay the same. So that's why that gap. With another 2,400 approved by the BPDA board within the last two years alone, development projects are being proposed to meet the goals set out by the city's housing plan, but there is no nuance to what housing types are needed to balance the needs of new and current residents. Whether a greater variety of rental housing aimed at a greater spectrum of income levels, home ownership opportunities for first time home buyers, or a diversity of unit types for increasing families, or seniors looking to downsize. We have some of the pieces of the puzzle in hand, but are in need of plans and policies that seek to actively dismantle the continued spatial inequalities in the neighborhood. In 2015, the city of Boston released Housing of Changing City 2030, and in 2017, Imagine Boston 2030 was released. These two plans have increased development pressures that are being felt across the neighborhood. For example, Imagine Boston 2030 identifies Beacon Yards at Alston as an expanded neighborhood. Although no planning has taken place for what Beacon Yards could be, there are major development projects taking place in areas around Beacon Yards, such as Linden Street, Cambridge Street, Braintree Street, the corridor area. Likewise, Western Ave and North Alston, North Brighton is being rezoned. However, corridor studies like the Western Ave study or Guest Street study can and usually does lead to spillover effects into surrounding neighborhoods. The Western Ave study and rezoning process, the Harvard Enterprise Research Campus, the Alston Mobility Study, various institutional master plans, the proposed I-90 realignment, and the potential opening of Beacon Yards for development provides us with an opportunity to hit the pause button and give thought to intentional and comprehensive planning to prioritize equitable development and anchor benefits for the community that are truly beneficial, whether that means increasing percentage increasing the percentage and or lowering the affordability standards of IDP units in certain parts of the neighborhood, identifying what types of market rate housing is most needed and finding balance between smaller units and larger unit types, increasing home ownership opportunities through deed restrictions and affordability programs, increasing open space and other forms of green infrastructure or improving public transit systems through increasing investments in the MBTA. These can all be done through zoning. 
whether through overlays, establishing special districts, incentives for developers, etc. A comprehensive neighborhood plan for Alston Brighton would help in mitigating some of the challenges the neighborhood has been experiencing and help ensure that the goals laid out in the city's housing plan and in Mo Imagine Boston 2030 build upon the strengths and assets of the neighborhood. A neighborhood for those who call Alston Brighton home can continue to have the opportunity to add to the vitality of the community so that Alston Brighton remains to be a neighborhood of choice. Thank you. Yes, go for it, Joanne. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. As Council Braden said, uh, I am the executive director of Charles Hugh Inc. In partnership with the community builders, we own Charles Hugh Residences, a 240 unit affordable mixed income development on Western Ave. In addition to the residences, we also offer 15,000 square feet of affordable retail space and a large community center that's available to the entire Austin Brighton community. Over the last several years, our neighborhood has been besieged by rampant opportunistic development made possible in large part by the lack of a master plan and process that would identify the community's housing needs, the infrastructure necessary to support new housing and commercial development, and public realm and community benefits that specifically address the needs of each corridor and area of the neighborhood. This development by development approach has given developers the advantage as they've been able to circumvent the recommendations of existing corridor studies because they're a single project, thereby exacerbating the crisis of housing affordability, decreasing the diversity of housing type and unit mix, overburdening the infrastructure and creating unsustainable and piecemeal community benefits. The exponential increase of market rate development of compact and one bedroom units has priced out moderate and middle income individuals and families who would like to remain in Austin Brighton. And it's discouraging new families who would choose to live in our neighborhood. The small number of IDP units produced does not come close to meeting the need uh, for affordable units. And at 70% of the area median income, it is out of reach for most Austin Brighton individuals and families. In the last 10 years, Austin Brighton has only seen the development of just over 400 truly affordable units compared to the 7,000 units that are already uh, in addition to the 3,000 um, that have been spoken to. Charles U with its 240 units, which is Section 8 and tax credit, um, the 20 units of affordable home ownership that came as a result of that redevelopment, 90 Antwerp Street, which will have 20 units of home ownership, 12 of which will be affordable, and the JJ Carroll Apartments with 142 units of senior housing. Our wait list at Charles Hugh is nearly 1,200 families and is an indication of the interest families have in living in Austin Brighton and the, and the need for an affordable mixed income housing. The turnover is extremely low with only four move outs in 2020. So you can imagine how long it will take for those folks in our wait list to gain access to our housing. As an organization, we continually explore opportunities to contribute to the development of new affordable and mixed income housing because we see this critical need every day. Unfortunately, land and property that could potentially be developed has long been secured by our university neighbors and for-profit developers. There are many challenges facing the Austin Brighton neighborhood and as we grapple with Boston's housing and infrastructure crisis, Austin Brighton can and should play a significant role in addressing these issues, but not at the expense of the existing community. A master plan for the neighborhood will create the opportunity to address many of these challenges by further understanding and consolidating the studies and planning underway, identifying the inequities, gaps, and challenges in these planning efforts, and create an inclusive plan to ensure that Alston Brighton is a welcoming and sustainable neighborhood for all. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. I see Dr. Natalicia Tracy's here. So we'll go with Dr. Tracy, followed by, uh, let's see, Nick, uh, and then Scott. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalicia Tracy. I am the executive director of the Brazilian Workers Center here in Alston Brighton Village. I'm also a lecturer in labor studies and sociology at UMass Boston. The Brazilian Workers Center began in Alston and has remained here for over 26 years now. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, founded by immigrants for immigrant workers. And our mission is to support greater Boston Portuguese and Spanish speaking immigrants, workers, both women and men, on issues of workplace rights and immigration. We work, we work 
through organizing advocacy, education, leadership training, capacity building, civic participation, research and policy work in order to promote our communities, exercise its civic and human rights, fighting against economic and political marginalization. And the uh, highlights are uh, immigrants' positive contributions to our local communities and economies. The COVID-19 pandemic has heightened our awareness of the social and economic inequalities and that we have to respond to the immigrants' communities emergency needs with our food pantry for the past year and that has served over 90,000 individuals for people from all Austin Brighton immigrants groups. And they are from Latin American, Asian, Caribbean, Middle Eastern, and Russian, as well as American seniors and young people. And we are now serving a community sites for COVID-19 vaccination. We love being, we love being, um, we love being in our neighborhood and it has been ever changing, but um, has always um, and has always been remain rich in diversity. Our of nationality, culture, race, age, and income. This is a strength of Alston Bright that has uh, been, you know, especially important to us because it's vibrant and it is in its character. New development already begun here. However, threatening all of this. The housing and economic opportunities available in the emerging neighborhood are not affordable or accessible to most current residents. They threaten to make Austin and more, more homogeneous, let's just say wider, expensive neighborhoods that immigrant, hardworking people of low and modest income doing essential work for all Bostonian are not, cannot afford. Our rich store of small ethnic business will follow the immigrants as they are slowly displaced from the neighborhood. The nonprofits that serve the, our neighborhood, like ours, are also uh, seriously threatened with displacement. Progress and growth are not bad, and our city has been ever dynamic, and we certainly need jobs since the pandemic has has caused thousands of people to lose work and have no money to pay rent or feed their children. But we need to make sure that growth is inclusive and that we raise the percentage of affordable housing and, and units made available. Work, workforce development training should be made available and tailored to immigrant needs. We also need to be embracing our immigrant families we have here, including so many that are part of mixed status, with US-born citizen children, but with parents and elders sometimes have more insecure immigration status. Our All our outreach and services for residents should be multilingual, multicultural sensitive, so that we preserve what is rich and is special about our vibrant neighborhood. We need to preserve a place for the small businesses and nonprofit that serve immigrant community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Natalicia. Nick? Oh, sorry, Everyone. I want to recognize that Councillor Edwards has joined us as well, too. Good morning, Councillor Edwards. Go for it, Nick. Cool, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Nick Rico. I'm a founding member of Artist Impact and a working musician living in Alston. And I'm happy to be here and have this opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, thank you counselors for calling for this hearing and inviting Artist Impact to be part of this initiative. Um, and thank you everyone for taking the time to be here and sharing your perspectives. Um, as an organization, we do believe that a master plan for our neighborhood is quite simply essential in order for it to retain the vibrant artist community that Alston was once known for. Um, the unmitigated gentrification described by previous panelists is nothing short of a death knell for the creative workforce. Um, unless these proposed projects along with the city of Boston establish clear prioritization for artist resources. For decades, community benefits have been funneled away from necessary arts investments, such as uh, versatile artist workspace, subsidized retail space for small businesses, 
indoor and outdoor event space, live music venues, pop-up locations, resource protections, preservation efforts, career development centers, and most importantly, affordable housing. Um, resistance to a cohesive master plan uh, implies a lack of vision, but more critically, a lack of values. And throughout my work as a creative in the city, it's become ever more clear that Boston likes the idea of having an arts community, but is unprepared to invest in maintaining it. Uh, this trend is a glaring testament to how undervalued and exploited artists are here. And the fact is revealed every single time another developer claims interest in supporting local artists, but comes to the table with a measly 13% IDP and a mural on the side of a parking lot. Meanwhile, wait lists for artists' work lift spaces extend well past two years, and the table scraps of IDP units that we do get still aren't affordable to 80% of our population. The artist's exodus from Boston is nothing new, though. It pushed people from downtown districts to here, and now that all those neighborhoods are dangerously devoid of culture, we're next. The city is notorious for failing its artists, and the only way now for it to prove it values us is to carve its values in stone. We need commitments from the city that translate to requirements and guidelines for developers. We need policies that create opportunity and equity while fighting displacement. We need resources and those resources need to be protected. Councillor Breeden has previously stated her interest in establishing Alston Brighton as a recognized arts district. And I think that's a lovely idea. And I am all for supporting that effort, but it bears the risk of doing more harm than good unless the correct foundation is laid. I and Artist Impact are prepared to commit to helping this vision happen, but I promise you that the artists of this city have no interest in committing to a city that does not commit to us. Hearing the rest of these testimonies, it's been made clear that everyone is tired of having the weight of our neighborhood's character fall on our shoulders. Study after study gets carried out so that the city and the BPDA can say, tell us your concerns, write letters, we're listening, but the inevitability of harmful development never changes while more and more of us feel unheard. The truth is, there is no better time to lay this groundwork than now. And as policies that benefit working artists inherently benefit the entire community and all kinds of residents, we're recovering from a pandemic, we, know, we all know this, but these issues extended long before and they'll persist long after if we don't take this seriously now. So on behalf of the artists of Boston, if you want us, show us, because the clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Scott is next, and Scott will be followed by uh, our final three panelists, Tony, Desidoro, Tim McHale, and Anna Leslie. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Scott Madelon. I'm the owner of Stingray Body Art. I'm also the president of Austin Village Main Streets, a director on the Austin Board of Trade and a former president. And I have been involved with the business community. I started my first business in Austin over 30 years ago in a house in Austin, built it up to over 80 people. Um, I have a long resume working with hundreds of local merchants and the large institutions and the large businesses. And as everyone knows, small business is the economic engine of America. And small business and entrepreneurship is the key to community wealth and multi-generational multi wealth within the community. Um, and this has to be protected and it's not being protected. Um, the object lessons are obviously places like Harvard Square, which have become chain stores and uh, unaffordable to live in. And you know places like Revere Beach, uh, where there has been no investment in the business and entrepreneurial community. And it's essentially become a business wasteland. Um, we are discussing now on our boards things like affordable retail with all the developments coming in many of them are mixed residential and retail the businesses are being displaced the small businesses are being displaced and the community wealth will be displaced um uh and I would like to focus for a little bit on the issues that I face as a business person and that we've been discussing a lot in our boards, uh, and they are very focused around transportation and parking. Uh, as you know, there are at least four 
major initiatives going on. There's the mobility study. There's the ComAv phase three, four. Uh, there's the bus lanes. And then there's the Mass Pike. And, you know, there are plans to remove all the parking from Harvard Avenue. And there's plans to remove all the parking from Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, and as much as we support, and we truly do support multimodal transportation and other ways to get into the businesses, you know, people aren't just going to bike to Austin in the middle of winter to visit the businesses and go out to dinner and to do all the things that they do. Um, we end up in uh, these situations where we speak to the Mass Pike about commercial traffic repeatedly. I spent years going to the Mass Pike meetings uh, and raising commercial traffic. As you know, Star Drive doesn't carry commercial traffic. So it's not just 18 wheelers and box trucks. It's every food service, delivery, electrician, plumbers, lawn. I mean, everything for, you know, if they go into Brighton, they go up Cambridge Street. But if they're going to Austin, if they're going to Brookline, if they're going to BU, if they're going through Brookline all the way down to Kenmore Square, all the way into the Fenway, all that commercial traffic is being carried by Harvard Avenue. And it's only going to get worse. Um, we end up facing these issues where for all the best intentions of each of these different groups, because they're not coordinated, it feels like when the aggregate, we're going to create a worse situation for ourselves than we already have. We've already seen that uh, with the bus lanes, uh, which were only supposed to operate during peak hours, uh, we've created more traffic and we discuss issues like simple stuff like timing the lights or increasing the turn lanes so that the cars don't all bunch up. Uh, and we really don't feel like we're being listened to and we don't see our feedback going into the plans as they evolve over time. So it starts to feel like we're fighting a war on five fronts. We go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. We end up having meetings about the meetings, um, which is terribly frustrating and it can make people angry. And it starts to feel like it's almost being done on purpose. And of course, we know it's not. We know that everybody in their lanes are trying to do the best job they can, but without a lack of communication, without a master plan to bring this all together, all these different communities, uh, organizations, we're being kept divided. We, we, we can't all organize into one. We need help from the city with this. Um, another problem that we face is we sit down with one group and we start discussing some of these issues and they say to us, oh, well, that's the other group. Uh, and that's also tremendously frustrating because then we go to the other group and they say, well, that's not us, that's this other group. And some of it is so simple. Uh, we need to make the traffic flow more efficient. We have a tremendous amount of underutilized parking space, but um, people aren't just going to abandon their cars. It's up to us to come up with plans to better utilize. And there's so many simple things we can do. One of the issues I face as a small business, for example, is as simple as the parking meters, where every two hours you actually have to get in your car and drive around the neighborhood to find another parking spot. Well, my customers are driving around the neighborhood. My employees are in the driving around the neighborhood. It costs my company hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for people driving around the neighborhood. So, uh, you know, we are so divided and we so welcome the opportunity to bring everyone together. But, you know, as Jason said, or I believe it was Jason, like we need to hit the pause button. All of these issues, the residential and the retail, they're intrinsically tied together. The ownership of small business, the entrepreneurial ship, the employees who work in those businesses, all the local companies that provide goods and services and deliveries to these businesses. Uh, we can't just let Austin become a giant traffic jam and we can't just take away all the parking. There has to be some hard decisions made and we have to work together on them because we're not talking about an existential future 20 years from now. We're discussing the very survival of Austin and Brighton, the second largest neighborhood in the city of Boston. So this is of the utmost importance. I know we're not going to solve these issues today. So I want to thank everybody uh, who's attending, everybody who's speaking, and everybody who's listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tony Desidoro. I am president of the Alston Civic Association. I want to thank Councillor Brayden for sponsoring this hearing. 
and for her leadership in pursuing this initiative. I also want to thank Councilor Mejia for her leadership on reforming the impact advisory group process and all the counselors who have advanced reform packages related to any aspect of the development process. I also want to thank Director Golden for all he has done to achieve greater uh, accountability and transparency related to project specific information. Given the unprecedented development taking place in our community, private, public, and institutional, and the fact that Article 51 of the Boston Zoning Code, the Austin Brighton Neighborhood District, turns 30 years old this November, it is reasonable and appropriate to conduct a high level review at this time of who we are and where do we wanna be in the future. Planning and mobility studies since 1991 have been appreciated but fragmented in their scope. A comprehensive approach is warranted and extremely overdue to ensure the efficient use of available resources and timely implementations. In the few minutes I have, I would like to approach this from a perspective of the impact spot zoning is having on our ability to build community. Not brick and mortar, but individuals. Mayor Walsh's 2030 housing goals, which began at 53,000 units citywide and recently revised upwards to 69,000 units, not only disproportionately impacted the Alston Brighton community, but more importantly, given the lack of community-wide planning, vested decision-making to City Hall to predetermine what types of housing they deemed appropriate for our community. What has frustrated numerous residents is this historic moment in the city's history where we had an opportunity to promote a more balanced and diversified housing mix, and in some cases, reversing counterproductive trends have gone unfulfilled. In many ways, the false narrative being promoted suggests the mayor's 2030 housing goals were more of a numbers game rather than a community needs assessment. What is equally troubling is how this approach has exasperated ongoing problems with inequality among the social groups in many of our mixed income neighborhoods. Building a more diverse and inclusive community that promotes civic engagement often results in alienation and isolation. To quote my good friend, Director Golden, at the public event renaming the BRA to the BPDA back in 2016, quote, there are still far too many people, far too many community organizations that view the organization negatively. And we think that by emphasizing planning, by being in the neighborhoods talking about planning, receiving meaningful input from the people of Boston and adopting planning documents that can accommodate quality future development, we will have greater public support, greater legitimacy, and greater credibility." End quote. Engaging citizens at all levels of city planning, not just at hearings for large developments, needs to be pursued if that vision is ever to be achieved. Most importantly, not only must citizens be convinced that their input is being taken seriously and that results are not predetermined, but that the judgments made in an inclusive way with the community be adhered to and not rendered obsolete as soon as they are memorialized. I trust the people of Austin Brighton, if given the opportunity to imagine a future that embraces everyone with opportunity and happiness. Projections of population and business loss due to the cost of living and the cost of doing business are real and profound. Judgment Day is approaching. Are we as a city up to the challenge? I ask the city and our development partners to humanize this process, respecting and understanding the significant stress and uncertainty the process places on everyone 
and to reach out in partnership to build a more sustaining community. Let's never reduce our community down to a profit and loss statement, but rather celebrate the richness of the people who call Alston Brighton their home. Let's move forward together with a renewed sense of community that is welcoming, affordable, and provides a sense of belonging. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Timothy. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, am I coming through? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wu and all the other councillors uh, for putting this together. Uh, this is my first time addressing the council. It's kind of a, a nice moment. Again, my name is Tim McHale, uh, an Austin Brighton resident since 1974. I would like to speak to uh, Harvard's institutional expansion and the, the coattail development following Harvard's example. As chair of the Harvard Austin Task Force, we grapple with many issues constantly. Uh, these issues are not unlike the rest of Austin Brighton. We'd like to know if future development is all about creating another economic engine like the Seaport or Kendall Square. Are we favoring corporate office parks for a town center environment? Are we tilting our aim to huge development projects at the price of serving seniors, families in a diverse fabric we call home? Will our community be converted to a wasteland of corporate structures for an eight hour workday or into a livable, walkable, vibrant neighborhood active for 18 hours a day? We see the benefits of education and economic development institutional and corporate expansion. We see these benefits that foster great places. We believe this is attainable though, through a coordinated, honest, and visionary process called master planning. All great neighborhoods have these in common, these ideals of arts and culture, economic development, education, housing, open space, public realm, sustainability, and transportation. In North Alston, we have been planned to death over the last 15 years, and yet we are only halfway there. We're still, we're still kicking. We've been through the NASPF, the CWP, the AB Mobility Study, uh, the Guest Street, and now the Western Ave Study. The results of these studies, though, have helped the community navigate through the excitement and the challenges and pitfalls that come with billions in development. Many factors influence this development journey, and we have remained vigilant, resourceful, patient, and creative. Why have we been successful in weathering this tsunami of projects? Why? Because we had a framework to work within. The planning process was our infrastructure where ideas can be exchanged and direction established. I cannot imagine what our neighborhood would look like if we didn't have it. We are trying to connect many dots, many, many of them, and only a systematic approach fueled by knowledgeable and reasonable people. Uh, and where am I? <laughs> that, uh, I was a reasonable person until I was talking to you. These are some of the parameters that lead to a successful master planning process in our neighborhood. Oh, so these are these are some of the, the things that have worked for us. Harvard is partner, okay? Make them part of the visionary process in planning our neighborhood. And they have been, and we want to foster that, even put it on steroids. They bring incredible resources of expertise, land, and community benefits. We have identified most of the issues and see most of the solutions, but they would go nowhere without Harvard. This also applies to all institutions that call home Austin Brighton. Next is getting an outside consultant to do the planning. This is important. Now, the BPDA is a great planning and, and development agency, but let, let's, you know, they're over, overworked, underpaid, understaffed, like every other institution. And its planning capacity has been best utilized when a third party private consulting entity has been contracted. 
In our experience, the boldest and most creative ideas were brought to the table by outside consultants. Next, planning should follow zoning and not the, wait a minute, no, zoning should follow planning and not the other way around, right? So let's identify the scope of these eight ideal uh, highlighted above, like public realm, open space, housing, retail, economic development. Let's identify those areas and the scope and the breadth of them. And then what's left over, let's put the buildings there. And, and put, instead, we are putting the buildings first and all the other good stuff that makes the fabric of a neighborhood follow. It's, it's backwards. So in closing, I'm just going to say it's much easier to build office parks than a neighborhood. So let us endeavor to take the high road and raise the quality of life of everybody. So I'm grateful that I had this opportunity to express my thoughts with you this morning. And I hope the, the council votes affirmatively in helping our part of the city of Boston engage in a master planning process. Thanks very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. And last but certainly not least, um, Anna Leslie. Good morning. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks to the councilors for hosting us. And um, you all are on time. You are ahead of schedule. I, <laughs> I'm impressed. So well done. Um, so and I'm pleased to close out the panel because everything that has been shared this morning is an issue of public health. And that's what I do. Uh, I direct the Alston Brighton Health Collaborative, have been the director for the past seven years. And we are a backbone network of over 40 community stakeholders focused on improving the social determinants of health the systems and the structures that determine our health and our livelihood. And a guiding principle of public health is assessing a community's assets and needs, a landscape assessment, um, and doing that in partnership with community through participatory research. This allows for a comprehensive assessment that includes those determinants. And a lot of folks have talked about housing today, um, about key issues that impact people's ability to stay and thrive in the neighborhood. Um, you all have heard me talk about transportation and mobility equity. So I'm going to focus on other aspects of the landscape that are essential to all of us, uh, specifically food and food access. And that's another key part of the work that we do in the neighborhood. Food access points are of course influenced by planning and zoning. There are intentional reasons that food is more and less accessible to people. It is not by accident and it is not a natural cause. So it's a factor of zoning and planning. And that's why in the public health landscape, we no longer call these food deserts. This is food apartheid. This is intentional and this is by choice. In Alston Brighton, Oak Square experiences food apartheid with no comprehensive food source within one square mile. Uh, it's why we started the farmer's market in Oak Square. Food access is not solely about physical proximity. We can all live next to a Whole Foods and not have the income to afford the food inside. So I would argue that we have other areas of food apartheid based on price throughout the neighborhood, which again, is the second largest neighborhood in the city. We're talking about 70,000 people. So this is the experience of thousands of our residents, our neighbors, our friends. You've heard from Natalicia, and while the community and organizations, including us, um, respond to these gaps with pantries, with pop-ups, with deliveries, these are Band-Aids. Last year in the neighborhood, SNAP enrollment increased by 62%. We have at least five new emergency food providers in the past year. So planning can address this fundamental issue of equity. We can fill these gaps and increase access for families and residents while also creating new economic opportunities and jobs. Planning is this comprehensive approach that we do in public health that examines the system. It takes into account the transportation access and gaps, the financial gaps, resident needs and interests and resident voice. So as you've heard, we cannot continue to have a patchwork approach to basic community health needs that requires community organizations to respond and react. We need a proactive, planned, community participatory approach to the future of this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Um, we'll now circle to councilors for questions, starting with the lead sponsor, Councilor Brayden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also want to thank all of the 
community activists and people who think about these issues every day and attend meetings almost every day of the week during the week work, work week and sometimes two on a two at a time two meetings on a day i really appreciate all your advocacy your passion um in terms of uh, this is more of a question for um for jason can you speak a little jason to the um you know the the, this, the discrepancy between uh, the sort of housing that we're building in terms of affordability and the actual earning capacity of the folks who live in Austin Brighton? Sure. So um, we we have this program that, that we're, we're you know launching at the Austin Brighton CDC. It's the People's Planning Initiative. And what it is, it's, it's really focused on providing residents and other stakeholders um, the ability to participate in the um, discussions that are happening in the community around our own planning and, and development. Um, a piece of this is to show sort of the, the housing mismatch um, that, that, that is currently taking place between what is being proposed and what is actually be, and, and what is being developed compared to, to neighborhood incomes. Um, I know city councilors have become um, well aware of the Coalition for a Truly Affordable Boston sort of like um, image showing um, citywide what's being developed across the city and what's being developed, um, you know, what's, what's being developed across the city compared to what the city incomes actually are. Um, we, as a member of the Coalition for a Truly Affordable Boston, also took a look at that and kind of did a hyper-local view in, in Alston and, and showing that a majority of the units that are being built in Alston and, and Brighton um, do not meet um, the neighborhood incomes, and so the 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 in, the median income for Alston is around fifty percent AMI, fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, and in Brighton, it's a, it's a little a little bit higher. However, if you look at you know the income levels of what's being built, it's you know for for upper middle income and, and upper income folks. So it, if you look at the the image, and I can share it with the city council, it, it's flipped um, in terms of what the need is and what's being built. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of meeting the need, because, you know, I have this saying that affordable housing is recession proof. Um, if you build enough housing that a majority of folks can afford, there's always a there's always someone who's who's ready to, to rent that. However, if you build a bunch of micro units um, targeted at twenty five hundred dollars a month, you, you're limiting your your market. Um, and so we need to be a little more nuanced, I think, in, in our approach in terms of what we're building and, and who we're building for, because ultimately none of us, you know, want housing that's just sitting vacant. Um, and I know COVID obviously has impacted the rental market slightly, so rents might be going down, units might be vacant. However, the real estate industry will will recover pretty quickly, I believe, post-COVID. And so I think we have a unique moment right now before the market kind of takes over again and, and moves everything, you know, into to, to hyperspace where it was um, for us all kind of collectively to get our breath and figure out, you know, what is the need um, in the community. So uh, thank you, Jason. Um, Madam Chair, I'd also ask um, uh, for if Tim Davis could share his insights on this issue, because he's, he's done a lot of research into uh, at the DND and on, on, you know, the the affordability and and what's been built and see see what he thinks of this situation well i i would have to um start by saying with just some a quick overview um from some of the data that i shared with this uh, the council last week um alston brighton currently has alston has i believe 12 percent of its housing is currently income restricted and brighton is currently 13 percent income restricted which is lower than the citywide average. Um, and that the, um, in terms of other factors that were discussed last week that I think contribute to this discussion is that um, in terms of family sized units, um, let me see if I have this. Um, Alston Brighton does have 27% of its housing units, rental units are two bedrooms and 20% are three bedrooms. There are extent a large number of three family houses in the neighborhood. However, we do have the ongoing issue of students occupying many of these three bedroom apartments in the neighborhood, which uh, contributes to the problem as well. I'm not sure if that answers your question, if you have more detailed questions. So in terms of um, uh, finding a solution if, to the problem, um, 
because many of the three bedroom house, homes uh, that are rented by students and young professionals they're not going anywhere because they can pay, they can get a nice room in an apartment with friends for a thousand dollars a month whereas if they want to go for a studio uh, the mark the, the, they're asking 2100 2500 for a studio so it's an economic uh, no brainer that they're not going to give up their 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 room in the, in a two family with uh, friends uh, to go and spend twice twice as much money to live in a studio so i don't know in, in terms of other mus- other other solutions in other parts of the country uh, uh, how do we how do we get past this because Everyone says we'll build all these studios and that young people will move into the studios, but it's not happening. So uh, I think we have to hit the reset button and I'd love to get your your thoughts on that. Well, I think that there's actually two, probably there's actually two markets we're discussing here as well. There's the student market and there's the young professional market. And young professionals may be able to afford somewhat higher prices and also are probably more likely or more interested in having a place of their own. So those are both markets that are very large in your neighborhood. In terms of the kind of immediate, um, we did see that students, the student numbers living in our neighborhoods fell uh, because of COVID. Um, it wasn't that because dorms were closed, they moved into the neighborhoods. Actually, the dorms closed and they stayed home in their hometowns. So at least in this very short window, we have, an, we have a moment where rents seem to be probably more on the decline in Austin Brighton than they are in neighborhoods with fewer students. Um, In terms of this long-term issue, um, I think that it's important that we provide some small units, but we also provide family units. The uh, AFFH zoning effort that was recently passed is another way in which we're trying to grapple with making sure that developers provide more family-sized units within their developments. Uh, both probably at both the market level and at the income restricted level to make sure that those are available to um, households. And um, it is given the way that the income restricted units are set up, it's um, all student households cannot access those units. And also because of the income limits, any uh, households that are like multiple young professionals, they usually become income ineligible for those units as well. So uh, family-sized income-restricted units usually do go to families rather than to uh, roommates. Thank you, Tim. Um, Madam Chair, I, that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, okay, let me see. It looks like Councillor Flynn is um, had to step away. So next up is Councillor Mejia. Let me check if... Councillor Mejia, are you still with us? Okay, she's on the way. It looks like she may have. Oh, okay, she's reconnecting. I'm so sorry. Can you? Oh my God! Can y'all hear me? I'm so yes, sorry. We can hear you now. I, I pressed the wrong button instead of going on off mute. I disconnected myself from the. Um, this, so my apologies for that. Um, so I'm just, thank you. I'm so incredibly grateful to all the advocates who have already spoken and I do appreciate the administration being here. I just have a few questions. Um, I'm really curious about, um, we talked, you know, uh, about Austin being an affordable, um, or potentially could one day be affordable, but there is an, a housing waiting list of 17,000 people. And I'm just curious how we are man we're imagining what affordability actually looks like. And there are also a lot of people who rely on three bedroom housing, but aren't quote unquote family. I'm thinking about LGBTQ youth in particular, and I'm curious how we are accommodating that need. And Austin has an incredibly diverse background, but the development space is always the same usual suspects. I'm curious about how we're creating development spaces that reach the whole community. And, um, while we're, while we're talking about that, there was something that I guess, I'm not, I'm not sure who it was, but they talked about the market. Um, and I, I think that when we talk about language that is uh, about markets, you know, it just seems like it's, it's a, um, 
it's a revenue generating kind of term that really loses the, the, the mark and misses the mark, if you will, on, on families and those who have been there for a long time. And I think if we're going to take advantage of any market or any situation that is happening, it's less about the, the, the breather and it's more about the opportunity about how we seize this particular moment in time to reimagine and redesign for its entirety how we're going to plan for for Boston, uh, for Austin and Brighton in a way that is community centered. I think that it's less about just seizing this moment um, and just really thinking about it for a long term in terms of planning and development. I, I think that if we could do this right, that would be great. And then my last question is around the pilot payments. Um, Boston College pays 23% of their pilot. How can we get them to pay more? So those are my questions. Thank you. Oh my God, was I on this? Hello? No, we can hear you. Um, let's just see who, who would like to jump in from the panel. Go for it, Nick. Uh, Lena here, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate those questions a lot because those are uh, ones that, um, that I, I find myself asking a lot as well. Um, and in a lot of studies, uh, especially um, referencing a lot of other existing uh, cities in general, but uh, specifically ones with arts districts, um, a lot of the things that uh, can solve a lot of those problems, um, I think, revolve around uh, policies like uh, rent to own policies, um, which also uh, tend to solve a lot of the issues uh, being discussed previously about um, students taking up a lot of family housing. Um, students become young professionals and young professionals eventually want to make families. And if we don't give them opportunities to build equity um, in the homes that they're already investing in during their college careers, um, you know, what's keeping them around afterwards. Um, so I think the fact that there is no uh, even like slight hint of a rent to own concept in Boston um, has, you know, that has everything to do with uh, why nobody, why so much of Austin, especially is so transient. Um, and uh, there was one other thing that you were talking about that I wanted to comment on. And I lost it, but if it comes back, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, okay, Joanne and then Tony next. Yeah, just um, just one other point um, around uh, figuring out how we are able to develop more um, family affordable housing. A part of the issue is that we um, do not have a lot of land or property because most of that has been... Um, bought by our neighborhood institutions. And so I think one of the things that we really need to think about is working with those institutions to identify properties um, that can be used um, for developing more affordable and family-friendly housing. The second piece I would say to that is that I suspect that with the infrastructure bill in Congress, when that gets passed, there will be a serious amount of funding for housing, and we need to be able to look at that in terms of creating the more deeply affordable housing that we need to have in the community. Yes, Madam Chair, just a couple of quick comments on the affordability issue. Um, I, I want to thank the council, uh, especially under uh, Councilor Lydia Edwards' leadership in terms of addressing the IDP issue. Uh, that issue has been out there for years. Uh, it is absolutely, in my estimation, embarrassing that the city of Boston is still at a 13% minimum, given that surrounding communities have been at 20% uh, for a couple of years now. And as far as I know, talking to people in those communities, development is doing just fine. The fear is that development would be hindered by raising the IDP minimums just has not occurred. And um, I appreciate the fact that this council is pushing the administration to once and for all uh, make some changes to that and get that minimum up. Also, too, uh, it's becoming a joke at the ZBA 
as to how many uh, proponents are coming in front of the ZBA with projects that are nine units large. Of course, there's a concentrated effort to avoid uh, imposing the IDP policy onto their projects. And that's another issue I know that the council is looking at as well. One other issue that doesn't get raised an awful lot, and, and I appreciated the efforts of the past administration to try to rectify it, although uh, the results have not been uh, terribly exciting, but especially a community like Alston, we need to have colleges and universities build more affordable on-site student housing and get undergrad, especially undergrad students out of our community. That is producing a very strong upward uh, pressure on rents in our community because uh, these absentee landlords end up charging huge rents to these students, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, being paid basically by the room. And I know that the mayor had set certain goals for construction of student housing. I know there have been some projects announced recently uh, in the city, but we have to get colleges and universities to do more of that because every time we build housing in our community that ends up getting populated with undergraduate student uh, students living there, we are letting these colleges and universities off the hook. And they're going ahead and expanding uh, their enrollments and in, in basically ignoring their responsibilities to housing their students because they simply feel the community uh, is going to absorb these additional students. So that's another issue that I hope the council will push forward on and get these colleges and universities to show more responsibility and to build more on-campus student housing. Thank you. Jason, then Nick. Just a few quick things. So that 17,000 uh, people wait list that was referenced by Councillor Mejia is the Alston Brighton CBC. Um, you know, the wait list is a little complicated when you get to, to, to that high because, um, you know, we do have nine properties in the community. And so people might be signed up for, for one or, or two of those. And so that means they might be double counted. Uh, so we're going through the process right now. However, um, upon the quick purge of the list and kind of cleaning up the list, our wait list is still over 10 years. Um, and so we will never build our way as an organization out of our wait list. Um, however, there might be an opportunity to build housing, have kind of like a pipeline approach to try to get people out of Alston Brighton CDC housing into other sorts of housing to then free up our wait list and kind of move people through the cycle of different sort of um, housing options. And so our last development that we built, new development um, was 2005. Um, and we have not been able to build since then. Um, we were in conversation with a, um, a, um, or, uh, a an entity that was looking to sell um, some of their property. Uh, we put in a very competitive bid, we thought of around 1.5 million just to acquire the site. And they said, well, we're in, um, we're entertaining offers around 6.5 million just to acquire the site, not to build anything, but just to own the site. And so obviously that cuts out affordable housing developers from being able to acquire property because we're not able to pay those high market costs or inflated market costs for, for land and what the land is valued for. Um, However, if we take approach more like how do we get more housing for 50% AMI folks, 60%, 70%, 80%, all the way through so then, you know, some folks can move into BHA. How do we um, increase, you know, um, the, uh, the public housing? How do we increase nonprofit housing such as the CDC, you know, and the other affordable housing developers in the community? How do we work with private developers to um, reduce um, affordability standards in some of their properties to house more, maybe 60%, 70%, eight, more income averaging. Um, there's the city um, voucher program that was just released. How can we utilize those resources in private development to increase um, housing opportunities for folks? Um, IDP is stated a lot. However, IDP in itself is not a silver bullet to fix the housing crisis. It can't. Not one, one policy cannot fix the entire housing crisis. However, we need all of the tools and the toolkit that we have as affordable housing developers, advocates, activists, and otherwise to provide housing for a range of folks. And so everyone needs to come to the table and say what little piece they can do, whether it's, you know, pieces of policy, the market, 
Um, and, and just to um, counsel me, he has a point in terms of when we're talking about market rate housing, the market and what that market is. Um, for folks who, need, who are having trouble affording their rent and need affordable housing, um, market rate housing is luxury housing. There is no sort of like distinction between the differences between $2,300 of rent for, you know, one bedroom versus, you know, $4,000 a month for rent for it, both are out of reach. And so we need to diversify the housing stock so that, you know, um, people don't just sit in housing, um, you know, because it's affordable to them and their families are growing. They, you know, older folks need to downsize because they're getting too, um, older and they don't want, um, they don't have the opportunity or the ability to take care of their homes, but they don't want to go into assisted living. Um, you know, we need to look oh, at our housing oh. market and the housing opportunities more in terms of like, like a matrix, like where are we putting the dots and how are we connecting those dots so that, you know, folks can, um, you know, basically grow through the Alston Brighton housing market, you know, from, from cradle to grave, so to, so to speak. Thank you. Nick? Um, just piggybacking off of that point um, about the market, uh, the market is, in this neighborhood is relatively arbitrary. Um, it's artificially inflated by developers that have no regard for uh, any element of the community besides what they feel they can charge, uh, you know, rich students. Um, and uh, the neighborhood AMI is not reflective of what the actual AMI is. And, um, uh, the median incomes of surrounding neighborhoods are drastically negatively impacting uh, the benchmark by which developers think they can charge here. And I know that revamping area median income as a whole is a uh, pretty big task and probably impossible, but instead of trying to rethink AMI, I think we just need to start acknowledging that it cannot be the only frame for which we create housing anymore. We need actual accurate numbers for the people that live in this neighborhood and in this neighborhood exclusively, what their needs are, and make sure that the housing percentages are reflecting those needs because it's it's just so out of character every single time it comes to the table. Um, and we fight the same fight every single time. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Mejia, are you good with questions? Yeah, no, I'm really great. Thank you so much for all of that. Really do appreciate it. And I do think that there is definitely a lot of work that still needs to be done in this space. And so looking forward to the, not the conversation about the conversation, but the continuation of what the action will be as a result of this hearing. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Edwards is next, and then I know Councillor Braden has a second round, so we'll come back for second rounds after that. First of all, I wanted to apologize for being late. Um, I have had the privilege of kicking off two master plans in my district, one for Plan East Boston and the other one for Plan Charlestown. And each one took different approaches um, to getting done and different kinds of partnerships. I just wanted to kind of run through some of the lessons I've learned <laughs> uh, and how uh, to push this um, uh, initiative forward. And um, I I completely agree, you know, there's a partner that will always be there, which is the um, BPDA. But while I, I think it was um, Ted that commented that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's understaffed and working very hard, I, I, I still, um, this is no knock to them, but push for it and push for the plan. And I honestly think if there had been a citywide uh, commitment of funding and infrastructure understanding, uh, we wouldn't be going neighborhood by neighborhood like this and in that they have to fight so hard to get one, right? We should have we should have been a list. All plans that are older than 10 years in East Boston, they were from the 1990s. Anything over a certain level should immediately trigger a master planning process so that we're constantly moving along. You know, I want people to also understand and what we in East Boston should have been a little bit more uh, clear about and, and even more clear in Charlestown, master planning is about how you are going to change. Let me be very clear. It is about how you're going to change. And if done right, it is done by the people who will be impacted by that change. 
right? So that's one of the biggest lessons because a lot of people are hoping master planning stops development. It does not. It is a guide for how to change and develop and maintain a neighborhood if done right. Then there's also questions, at least for Charlestown, we learned this, um, who's at the table matters. What we didn't have as much of, um, maybe because we have a little bit more room, is uh, BPS. So I, I, I don't know if you have um, enough uh, education facilities or not in Alston Brightner, if that would be a, a priority for you. I know that, yeah, Councilor Braden, you've been per working so hard uh, on the pilot and making sure you have good neighbors in the higher education institutions. But in as much as you're trying to make sure that there's a maintained good neighborhood or that some of the younger folks who are moving into AB feel that they can stay there, um, that has a lot to do with the education facilities that you have. So BPS needs to be at the table. They also have their own 10-year um, build BPS program that is worth, I think, over a billion dollars. So if that's not part of the plan that's happening in the neighborhood and there's a disconnect, you're going to find that they bump up against each other. Um, I think uh, right now we're, we're in our, because of, the, because of the pandemic, we've been delayed in East Boston, but now we're going square by square and we're doing uh, community outreach meetings and we've um, done different ways to meet community where they are. So the planning is supposed to be community centered. So we've met at bowling alleys. We, <laughs> we've met at different uh, eating places for inviting folks over for pizza, all of these different places uh, with the attempt of trying to meet people where they are. Of course, I know you already know to have interpreters of more than one language there to make sure that the immigrant community is, is also centered. Um, not speaking English has nothing to do with not being able to vision a beautiful neighborhood, right? So um, the other thing we wanted to do is um, make sure that you are planning um, appropriately for, for traffic. Uh, there, it has to change. Uh, no, we are not immediately getting rid of all cars, but yes, if you plan for more cars, you will get more cars. And that's a that's a dichotomy that we need to recognize um, and also stop. Um, there's ways in which you can plan for increased mobility, which is more important than whether the whether your constituents or whether folks are getting in cars. So that's another lesson learned. Um, the, finally, um, if, a couple things I, I wish we hadn't done as much of is um, when we had an open meeting uh, for community to come in, uh, developers happily came and sat down at the table <laughs> with, with folks from East Boston and, and, and wanted to help us come up with plans. And I think that that's something I would kind of push back on if the uh, BPDA and anybody else, when you see developers coming to the table, if they're coming, it should be to listen. Nothing else. Nothing else. And it's not because they're bad. It's, it has, it's just that if you really need community buy-in for a plan that is coming from community, those who are making money in this moment need to just be quiet. That's all. So I just wanted to kind of go through the list. We're in the middle of two different plans. Um, also, um, your geographic definition of where you want your plan to go is also key. We wanted all of, all of East Boston, but for Charlestown, we wanted the core to be left kind of alone uh, where there's most housing. And the peripheral was, was where we, we felt that was more, we could be more aggressive. So your geographic definitions of where the planning should happen and where the massive changes should happen or not. Again, I don't, I don't know um, if you want all of Alston Brighton or if, you, if there's certain areas and sections of it as well. Uh, finally, I know each institution, academic institution has their own institutional master plans. So you have master plans going on within your greater master plan. And so making sure the community is fully aware of all those commitments from those institutions to hold them accountable and to increase them would be the goal. So those are just some of the lessons I've learned um, in the recent um, uh, master planning in both uh, East Boston and Charlestown. So that was it. And thank you to all the folks and advocates um, for coming out. I know Anthony, I had the pleasure of speaking at the Civic Association um, I've had the pleasure and honor to work for Natalicia when I was at the Brazilian um, Immigrant Center, now the Brazilian Worker Center. Uh, so I used to commute every day on the B line from East Boston to Alston Brighton and um, got to know the community very well um, from the immigrant worker community sides, especially. So 
uh, it is a neighborhood that's near and dear to me, and the planning of and preservation of it um, is something that means a lot to me. Even though I'm I'm District One, uh, uh, District Nine's in my heart. So that's it. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for those excellent points, um, Councilor Edwards. It's really good to learn from your experience. Uh, of your recent experience with with um, with planning and so um, so this is a question for um, for Lauren Shirtliff, um, BPDA. Um, you know we've had a we've heard we've been talking now for an hour and a half, and um, you know you can see there's a level of um, serious concern and and a really high level of interest in making sure that we we learn from the mistakes and 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 develop a, a vision that's inclusive and equitable going forward. So, you know, in terms of capacity and your and the BPDA's response, what are the chances that we can get a community-wide um, master plan that integrates so many of the pre-existing studies uh, to really uh, envision uh, a, a new future for Austin Brighton that, that's community-led? So, um I'm not going to be able to fully answer that, as you can imagine, Councillor. Um, I'm not the one that, you know, kind of makes the decision on, on you know, where we uh, push resources, um, you know, within every, any given fiscal year. Um, that being said, as you know, we've already been discussing that there is still more planning that absolutely needs to be done. Um, you know, my charge is, is to help the planning team um, implement Imagine Boston. And we still have a long way to go. And, you know, I mean, if, if there wasn't a long way to go, uh, there would be no point of having even the field of planning, right? Um, and, you know, we are excited, especially to dive into some of this. Um, the challenge does remain one from a resources perspective. So I can just say, you know, from my heart, I have been listening to everything everyone has been saying. And, you know, there've been a lot of really great points raised. And I think that we actually see eye to eye on a lot of it. Um, it just, it's something I need to go back and discuss with uh, Brian, our director and our board and, you know, continue the dialogue that way. The other question I had was in, in terms of, um, you know, the, uh, the new uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, zoning uh, ordinance. I, I don't know how that's been incorporated into your thinking at the BPDA. Well, it, it is actually in the zoning now. So any uh, large project, any PDA project um, has to comply with it. Um, you know, it's something we work very closely, uh, members of our staff uh, with Councillor Edwards and others. And we're really proud of um, the fact that we were able to get it into the zoning um, and kind of push for that effort. We're the first uh, city nationwide that has done that. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see also how it's implemented and what the future you know, looks like in the next six months, a year, two years, a lot of these things, you know, from the ideas to policy phase, and then actually seeing, you know, how it bears fruit, um, it's going to be fascinating to watch and, you know, rest assured any project um, that comes, you know, to the table has to now comply with it. Thank you. Madam Chair, in the interest of hearing from, uh, we have a lot of folks signed up to, to give public testimony. Uh, if 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 it's um, a timely, if it seems like the right time, perhaps we should take public testimony. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, yes, I I am trying to just think through if I had anything else that I wanted to sneak in as a question. Most of mine have been asked already. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up separately with with anything individually. Um, so let's go to panelists. I'm going to pull up my list of who was signed up in which order. Okay. So let me see. I believe uh, State Rep. Kevin Honan's office was perhaps going to send a representative, um, but I do not see Carla on at the moment. Um, okay, I'm going to add some people. So we'll go first to Alex Cornicini, then um, let's see if Morgan is here. Let's see Morgan. Alex, then, oh, looks like Susan is not here any longer. 
Um, okay, I'm just going to go down this list. Alex, then uh, Susan, then Eva will be the first three. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna jump into it. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Cornicini. I'm the executive director of Alston Village Main Streets. I wanna spend my time today to talk a little bit about concerns from our local business community and then speak a little more generally about the way studies and development projects are conducted here at Alston. First, although I'm not a local business owner, I run an organization that directly supports over 300 businesses in Alston, and I wanna share a few concerns that I've heard throughout my time here. Business community is very concerned with the rapid pace of transportation changes in the neighborhood, which stems from the fact that there's multiple mobility and transportation studies happening simultaneously and our businesses feel a little left out of the planning process. Even if they do get their voices heard, they feel like they're not actually being heard. Many business owners have, had, uh, have expressed concerns about the potential decrease in parking spaces that they and their employees will be able to use, like Scott said. Uh, some business owners have lost days of man hours just from their employees having to move their cars every two hours because there's no employee parking programs available. Second, the rapid pace of new development, while some see as a benefit to local businesses, also bring out a sense of fear of uncertainty revolving around the commercial rents increasing, new competition, and the loss of traditional customer base. Some of our local businesses have even started getting pushed out of their storefronts due to new property owners deciding to demolish and renovate the spaces that they, they've spent decades in. Currently, there's no policy in place to prevent to protect local businesses from losing their spaces when the property gets sold and developed, and that needs to change. The amount of storefronts that have been sitting vacant for years is also a huge concern in the community. These property owners that are not even trying to rent out their commercial spaces bring a blight on the community with these empty storefronts. There needs to be some sort of policy that either incentivizes or penalizes property owners from, from sitting on commercial spaces. COVID relief has been a huge concern in the business community. These businesses have had a, to operate at half capacity or lower for most of this past year, while their rents have stayed the same. Now, while there were a number of great COVID relief grants from the city, the state, and the federal government, there needs to be more while we get back into the swing of things. And finally, there needs to be an overhaul around the way the city cleans up trash in Alston. We need more trash cans. We need more time and effort devoted to cleaning up our streets. It's not called Alston Rat City for no reason. And so in closing, you've heard from many different members of the Alston Brighton community speak up today, and one thing seems pretty clear. Our community hasn't felt like they're able to keep up with all of the changes in the city. Like Scott said, it seems like we're fighting on five different fronts. Housing, new development, transportation, mobility, COVID relief. While you see a very strong united group of individuals and organizations that dedicate their time and effort to fighting for a neighborhood that they love, we felt like the city and the state like to separate plans and approval processes to keep us disorganized. That's why this master plan is so important. And that's why, and that's why the city needs to look at Alston Brighton as one united community. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, Susan Rutkiewicz, would you like to speak? We'll go on to Eva Webster. Okay, I, I have unmuted myself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eva Webster. I have uh, lived in uh, Brighton for almost 30 years. I'm a homeowner. And uh, I have been uh, very actively involved in, in uh, our community life and currently serve as a co-chair of the Homeowners Union of Alston Brighton. I'm pleased that I have this opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, homeowners in our neighborhood because I believe that we are really uh, forgotten demographics. When I uh, heard um, all the previous speakers, maybe not all of them, but the, most of them, um, it, it, it strikes me that um, 
uh, only a certain part of our demographics are considered worthy of protection. And I will respectfully disagree with this approach. Uh, I studied our um, household incomes and, and um, uh, demographic uh, brackets and so on. And it is clear to me that about one third of, of households in Austin Brighton are low income, one third are middle income, and one third are over $100,000 a, a year uh, in income bracket. We have almost 2,000 households that make uh, cumulatively, mostly through um, uh, working couples, uh, you know, two, two income um, uh, owners, uh, over $200,000 a year. And I know that in the current political climate, it might not be so easy to get much compassion for people who are successful and have worked very, very hard in their lives to actually buy their homes and renovate them and maintain them. But I'm telling you that if we do not pay attention to this demographic, uh, Austin Brighton will become a low income ghetto. We do not make it attractive for homeowners to, and, and safe enough for homeowners to, to have the courage to invest in those old ho homes that require new plumbing, new electrical, reshingling, new roofs, and so on. And these are all aging housing stocks that should be maintained because these are homes that can truly uh, provide family-friendly living conditions. None of the new units that are getting built on Alston, in Alston Brighton really lend themselves to long-term living by families or people who really would like to have a decent quality of life. They are just cookie cutter boxes where it is, I consider it inhumane conditions. I mean, the, the way the, build, the uh, developments are planned, uh, there is no enough um, setbacks to plant real trees. So people look out the windows and they only see other people's windows. I mean, we are, we are creating a, the, the, almost a dystopian neighborhood and it's just creeping on us. And um, the, the way we go about developing Austin Brighton is going to urbanize it to the point that it will no longer be a traditional neighborhood, the kind of neighborhood that Mayor Menino used to be proud to protect. And we, we feel so incredibly disenfranchised and frustrated that the, the, all politicians are only paying attention to the demographics that they think is going to bring them the most votes. But this is not the way to plan a neighborhood. And the, you, you do not plan a neighborhood by having a parade of a grieved party demanding that something is given to them that somebody else has to work for. When I hear um, uh, the gentleman who represents the um, artists, stating that, um, you know, we should be providing rent to ownership opportunities for artists. I'm sorry, the, the, the Austin Brighton is um, surrounded by institutions that bring every year a lot of students to, to Boston. Those students have to live somewhere. And they're, they're, that's why a certain percentage of our housing stock has to rotate because with every year we are getting a new crop of students and that new crop of students cannot be accommodated as permanent residents in this neighborhood. Thank you, Ms. Webster. Uh, um, thank you. If you could wrap up our okay, okay, time. Just, 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 just very, very quickly. I really believe that we need to be paying attention to quality over quantity. We are never going to be, sat be able to satisfy uh, um, the, the demand on affordable housing with the amount of immigration that we are getting. So if we, it's, it's just disingenuous to be saying that we can satisfy this, this um, demand ever. And if we cannot satisfy it, then we should be planning this neighborhood, taking the quality of life of permanent residents into account. And, and our homeowners union of Alston Brighton will be doing everything in our power to expand our membership and to show up at the polls to fight for our quality of life and to make it possible for people to invest in renovating our homes and not feeling displaced because the low income people are not, not the only people that are getting displaced in Alston Brighton. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping notes. I'm going to start to move people back to attendees. So uh, the, the main room is a little clearer. So please don't be can offended as I'm, oh. as I'm moving people back up. Uh, Susan, oh, can Susan, I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, sorry. One second. Okay. I'm just going to just going to clean up our uh, main room a little bit um, okay. so we can have space for all of the public testimony to, to happen. And okay. uh, for folks who are interested in public testimony, if you could help me by uh, clicking the raise hand feature, that would be incredibly uh, beneficial because I now the lists don't quite match up and I'm not sure who exactly well, the problem is, is my notes testimony are on or another My notes are on another page. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, so next up will be Susan followed by Kevin Carragy, Galen Mook and Elizabeth Heyer. If everyone could please keep to two minutes, introduce yourself and your address for the record at the beginning. And I'm going to start to be a little stricter on, on the time limit as well. Okay, Susan, go ahead. So my name is Susan Rutwitz, and I live on 44 Lakeshore Road in the house. And I've lived there for 30 years. And so I've seen a lot of changes. And I've never done this before, so I'm a little nervous. But one thing is uh, the housing units being built should be more attractive. I've seen brown, boxy buildings on Tremont Street in Brighton. And using you know, nice colors and having gardens will make people happier. And um, and I don't want Brighton to look like a city with tall buildings. I mean, Jamaica Plain has more of a village-like feel, but of course, we're a lot bigger. I didn't realize we're a lot bigger than these other cities. So that was a shock to me. And, um, you know, flowers and trees, that will decrease the pollution. You know, trees, nice trees, um, but they're planting a lot of the trees too close together. Um, another thing is uh, we don't really have a good senior center. That Veronica Smith Senior Sweat Center, I think, is antiquated and small, and they really don't have a lot, a lot of activities. Many Brighton residents are getting older, they're tired laid off and many are single and it would be nice to have a place to meet and socialize and even a little coffee shop or something to keep people connected and healthy. And I look at, you know, the senior center in Newton, they have so many lectures, Zoom events, health information, live musicians. And I think something like that should happen. And um, probably have better, uh, we have, banks, pizza shops, and nail salons. And it would be nice if we could have, you know, a few more nice restaurants. I knew one new, one new one came to Brighton recently. I haven't tried it out. And um, also, um, we have, we had a, a, a convenience store and a dry cleaners closed because of the um, high rents and they were really good places to go. This, you know, people you, went to those places. And that's it. That's all, all I'm talking about. <laughs> that Thank was you. my list. We, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you Thank very you. much. Kevin. Uh, thank you uh, to the councillors, uh, particularly Councillor uh, Breeden for advancing this uh, proposal and Councillor Wu for uh, chairing this meeting. I'll stay within six minutes. Uh, six minutes. I have six points in two minutes. How's that? All right. Uh, first, uh, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of this proposal, and there's six reasons why I am. Uh, reason number one, Alston Brighton's a community at risk. We're at a oh, tipping okay. point. Why? We are a community at risk because of the displacement of working and middle class people from our neighborhood. Second reason for supporting this proposal, currently the BPDA engages in a piecemeal approach in terms of development in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods too. It's essentially one project at a time. We need a comprehensive approach, not a piecemeal approach. Thirdly, there was a wonderful opportunity uh, I am not a NIMBY. Uh, 7,000 housing units were constructed during the Walsh administration. We could have created more affordable units. We could have created more home ownership units. We did not do it. The opportunity was squandered, right? Uh, not a single major development, large scale development, went to 20% affordability despite repeated advocacy by many community groups and residents. 
And remarkably and sadly, home ownership rates actually declined during the Walsh administration. That's a remarkable failure of planning, in my view, both on the affordability front and on the home ownership front. Fourth, there's been widespread community opposition to large scale projects lacking affordability and home ownership. Our elected officials oppose the St. Gabriel's project. Uh, all but one oppose the stop and shop projects. They were green lighted anyhow by the BPDA and the Walsh administration. S two squandered opportunities. Fifth, corridor studies and university IMPs are not adequate replacements for a master plan because the universities and the corridors don't exist in isolation. Those planning processes need to be integrated with a master plan process. Sixth, residential and office development and lab development in our neighborhood, that's happening. Improvements in public transportation, significant improvements in public transportation are not happening. How we're going to move people in and out of these developments is actually an enigma uh, wrapped in a riddle, all right, uh, with no solution. Western Avenue needs a degree of public transportation, for example, but there's other corridors that need it too. And lastly, I appreciate the com comment by uh, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, a, a comprehensive master plan also has to include attention to our public school system and how our public school system can serve to enhance the neighborhood and development in the neighborhood can enhance the public school system. So I said I had six points. I actually made seven. I hope I stayed to two minutes. Thank you. I appreciate the hearing. I learned a lot. Thank you very much, Kevin. Okay, um, Galen, then Lizbeth. Afterwards will be um, Andrea. I apologize. I don't, I don't see your last name on there. Barbara Parmenter and Jill Rosati. Again, um, two minutes each. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Councilor Wu. Um, and Councilor Braden for calling this. Can you hear me okay? Quick thumbs up. Great. Thank you so much. I'll be very fast. My name is Galen Mook. I'm executive director of Mass Bike. We're a statewide bicycling advocacy organization, but I'm actually an Alston resident, um, have been since 2003 um, when I was a BU student and first came in. So I've gone through the whole uh, trajectory of being an undergrad, graduate student, founder of a nonprofit called Common Wheels, um, general advocate within the community, and now I'm running a statewide organization. So um, I get to see a lot of the multi-jurisdictional issues that I live in my neighborhood and fight them on a daily basis for my bicycle advocacy. So um, uh, though I'm approaching this from a lens of an advocate, I definitely have the work experience that I'm going to refer to shortly um, in terms of my main point of this comment. I do want to say a quick thanks, uh, of course, to the counselors for calling this, for attending, for your interest. Um, and to the BPDA, specifically Tad um, and Gerald and a few others who have been putting a lot of hard work into trying to consolidate this piecemeal um, based off the boxes with which they have to operate in. And I'm going to say that they are um, wonderful public stewards and their box is too limited. So hopefully this conversation can actually be an expansion of their work to say what can be overlapping so that they aren't just limited to mobility or aren't just incident limited to one institutional master plan, but really are holistically looking at this um, collectively. Um, I do want to mention uh, a quick point of thanks to Councillor Mejia for mentioning the diversity in Alston and Brighton. We do have a lot of diversity, economic diversity, racial diversity, age diversity. It is probably one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city based on the way that it is built and the uh, institutional pressures that force some of these hard challenges also then do produce a lot of good diversity. So I do want to um, give a nod to that and then also a nod to Councillor Edwards. I really appreciated that she said that we shouldn't even have to have a hearing about this. This should just be automatic. If a zoning code is more than 30 years old or about to be 30 years old, it should automatically be looked at by the city of Boston. Um, I appreciate the fact that we go through the public process, but we didn't need to spend two hours deciding we're going to do this. So I think that that is, that is key. My main point I want to make here is the institutionality and the multi-jurisdictionality of Alston and Brighton. It is not just the city of Boston. So my main encouragement here is to engage the DOT, the MBTA, 
the state highway, the DCR, as well as the institutions of um, Boston College, Harvard University, and BU, because they, more than the city, can direct what happens in transportation, um, can direct what happens in housing, can direct what happens in the school systems. So I'll leave my point at that by saying that, frankly, all of this needs to be wrapped all together. Everything is regional. Housing is regional. Schools are regional. Specifically, transportation is regional and safe transportation is key. And I'm going to say as a bicycling advocate, I've been very appreciative of all the great work the city of Boston has done to make safer cycling. But it doesn't do a lick of good once you hit the double tree because that's mass dot and DCR and it's a death trap. So in order to really make a holistic approach of a master plan, it shouldn't just be the city of Boston that we have to this table. But we need to do whatever we can from the mayor to the city council to really twist some arms to make sure that the state players and the institutional players are coming to the table just the same. Um, and with that, I know it's yeah. time, so I really appreciate your work here, Councilor Wu, and, and everybody for all the work going on out there. Thanks, Galen. Elizabeth. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Heyer, and I'm Chief of Real Estate and, in and Innovation at Two Life Communities. Uh, I live at 25 Freeman Street in Auburndale, but I work at Two Life's Brighton campus. And I want to thank Chairman, Chairwoman Wu and the members of the Committee on Planning, Transportation and Development, as well as Councillor Breeden and the BPDA for the opportunity to testify today in support of the proposal for an Alston Brighton Master Planning and Zoning Initiative. Two Life develops, owns, and operates affordable supportive housing for low-income older adults, including our largest campus, which is located um, in Brighton, um, in the kind of nook between Chestnut Hill Ave and Wallingford Road. And I can say that I'm confident that I speak on behalf of many, if not all, of our residents in saying that an Alston Brighton master plan that is inclusive of expanded affordable housing options with supports for older adults is an urgent need and a really high priority. In the words of one of our residents uh, recently, she said, instead of being afraid of what, what might happen to me tomorrow, I look forward to tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. And I haven't felt this way in many years. And this is what the staff and neighbors at Two Life mean to me. And I think this um, particularly is true during the past year in COVID when um, living in a supportive community setting, we were able to support our residents um, in ways that older adults who live at home alone were um, really not able to receive. So um, I wanna applaud the city of Boston for its commitment to being an age-friendly city. and. As an age-friendly city, Boston and the Alston Brighton neighborhood have a terrific head start to a master planning effort that takes the issues of age-friendly into consideration. And the age-friendly Boston action plan um, that was recently created is a really terrific blueprint for how to make Alston Brighton the best neighborhood to live and age in through the five-year process that they outlined to adapt structures and services to be more accessible and inclusive to residents of all ages and all abilities. Thank you. And if you could wrap up, thanks. Sure. I would just recommend that the Alston Brighton Master Plan address all the domains, but in particular with a focus on housing. Um, you know, this is important um, from a demographic perspective. You know, an estimated 20% of our residents will be over 60 years old um, by 2030, and many of them fall um, at an income level that's well beho below the poverty level, which makes it really hard to pay for housing and care and all the kinds of things that keep people out of institutions. So, um, you know, I really believe that a master plan that focuses on these age-friendly elements and in particular focuses on how to create more affordable housing for lower income older adults is especially important. So I'll wrap up there. I have a lot more data um, and things I think that could be shared around why this is so compelling. And we look forward to participating in the process I and mean, bringing that really important information to the table as we think about um, Austin Brighton as an age-friendly community. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea. Yes, you're muted. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Howard. I'm the CEO of the West End House. Uh, we are an independent boys and girls club in Alston. And uh, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to, to speak today on behalf of um, the folks that voices often underheard um, and uh, would like to have that amplified. And that's our young people. And, um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different elements of, of the Alston Brighton community today. And um, I think the one that is most often underlooked is uh, young people under the age of 18. I think there's still this misperception that um, Alston Brighton is off campus housing for, you know, large institutions. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to be present today to amplify the voices of young people that um, are looking for a community um, and a sense of community. Um, they're looking for opportunities to connect with, um, with other um, elements of the community, whether it's green spaces, whether it's other organizations, whether it's access to transportation. Um, and uh, I just, you know, between the young people that live in Alston Brighton and then the large number of young people that are bused in to Alston by Brighton for schools and then stay in the community afterwards to either come to a place like the West End House or Jackson Man Community Center or YMCA or go to work in uh, organizations in the neighborhood um, that let's please give some attention and some emphasis to the voice of our young people that um, that uh, could grow up to be homeowners, could grow up to be landlords, could grow up to be heads of institutions in our community if we make it welcoming and if we make it um, feel as though it's a supportive, inclusive community. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next up is Barbara, then Jill, um, will be followed by... I don't even know. Sorry, my timer. It's very casual. Um, Jill will be followed by Dan Cuddy and then um, Diane Klein and Karen Smith. Uh, hello, and thank you, Councillor Wu and Councillor Braden. My name is Barbara Parmenter. I live at 77 Harriet Street in Brighton. I'm a member of the Harvard Alston Task Force and 350 Mass Alston Brighton. And I taught graduate level urban planning for 27 years. I'm also a homeowner here. I very strongly support the Alston Brighton Master Plan and a new vision for our community. I see the inequities in Austin Brighton every week when I deliver groceries to struggling working families in cramped and often deteriorating housing. The current process does not address our critical needs, especially housing for hardworking residents who are so essential to our well-being. But I'll just speak to the process here. The planning process in Austin Brighton bears little resemblance to what is taught in professional planning schools. While I have a deep respect for our BPDA planners and I thank them for all their extremely hard work, the current system is not set up to support them, us, or a true planning process. It is a development approval process and an opaque one at that, where the role of different impact advisory groups is unclear, much less the voices of residents. Exhausted community members are left to decipher technical jargon with few explanatory sum summaries easily available in plain English much less in the languages many spoken by many of our residents. There is little consideration of project impacts beyond the limited site. We have major current projects and massive future proposals, but no explanation of how all the pieces will fit together or connect beyond the city limits. For example, we have major corridor redevelopment in Watertown leading directly to Western Ave, but it's as if we exist in two different countries. The Western Ave rezoning project is an attempt at a larger planning process and I support it. But it, even it is fragmented between different parts of the corridor. And while Harvard University controls many of the parcels in that area, it can't for some reason simply engage in an overall planning process with the community. The Harvard Austin Task Force has a special official IAG duties for two projects in the area, but not for the rest, while the Western Ave project has no official community guidance group at all. The city may lack capacity for a neighborhood master plan here, but that is something we need to change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well within the time limits, thank you very much. Okay, um, Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Rizzotti, elementary school art teacher in Brookline and founder of Arts District Boston, an aspiring nonprofit interested in opening a multi-purpose gallery and affordable studio space in Alston and committed to serving and providing opportunity to local artists. Today, I would like to share an anecdotal testimony about the importance of affordable housing. 
I'm an artist who was pushed out of Alston due to rising rent after living there for seven years. At one point, I tried to live in an affordable housing unit that is now the abandoned building on Linden Street. The whole building was filthy and felt more dangerous than it was worth for low rent. There were shared bathrooms, kitchen, and living space. It is not fair to expect people to improve their stature in life when they don't feel safe or can't stay clean or, look, or even look presentable enough for a job straight out of their front doorway. Affordable housing is also a women's right issue. I moved in with someone I didn't know as well as I thought I did so I could split the price of a room and keep my jobs. There were some nights I spent hiding outside in the dark several blocks from where I lived because it was safer than staying in my house. I was trapped in this living situation due to rent prices. I think it goes without saying I was not able to continue my art career while living in Alston. The limited studio space that was available was not affordable. Instead, I took odd jobs that did not make ends meet. Affordable living is a necessity. Thank you very much. Dan Cuddy. Thank you, Councilor Wu, Councilor um, Flynn, Mejia, Edwards, Flaherty. Uh, thank you, Council Breeden, for proposing the first master plan in Austin Brighton study. My name is Dan Cuddy. I'm Community and Government Relations Director at Brighton Marine, a veteran network community. I'm a lifelong resident and homeowner in Austin Brighton. I want to make a public comment to help ensure the master plan is approved and to address the need for equity, uh, diversity, representation, and inclusion. Um, there's a major focus on new development to meet the needs of Austin Brighton community. I want to thank Councilors Breeden for proposing this Austin Brighton master plan so the impact advisory groups uh, can be well informed to advocate for our neighborhood uh, with these contractual community agreements with clairvoyancy um, in order to meet the needs of the long-term residents and families living in mixed affordable housing now and in the future. I'd recommend a uh, welcoming community environment that has programming and services aligned specifically with updated public entities and facilities, such as our schools. Um, we just really need stronger school programming. Um, you know, we have to really advocate more for our black and brown populations. Um, our senior center, centers, um, daycares, uh, much needed job center, um, additional immigration service, community centers, and a, and a new cultural center that will focus our residents and families on inclusion, equity, and supports um, with service providers to move for residents to move up the economic ladder in unison with our higher education partners, job with livable wages, and align transitional workforce development housing. We identified in our local affordable housing, families and youth living in Fidelis Way, Commonwealth Tenants, Faneuil Gardens, housing have been underserved before and during COVID. The youth have been isolated and fallen behind beyond our suburban neighbors. In addition, our schools have been insufficient, underfunded, and our local community center that serves these families and youth is scheduled to be closed or displaced next year, along with the Jackson Mann Middle School and Elementary School and the Horace Mann School for the Hearing Impaired. The Jackson Mann serves the entire neighborhood, but specifically those living in our local affordable housing. I propose the rebuilding of a new community center and cultural center in the master plan uh, that meets the needs of the immigrant families, populations, and welcomes and supports Austin Brighton diversity and unity. Uh, there's 3% African American, according to the Austin Brighton Mobility Study, um, as the second largest neighborhood in Boston. That's not well enough welcoming. In respects to streamlining workforce development, job training for adults, young adults, 18 plus, and youth, Austin Brighton needs a devoted training provider and job placement agency. We need to provide job trainings for our local life uh, sciences companies utilizing Boston neighborhood job trusts with linkage monies. Programs for our local residents, we need to research transitional housing to add launch programs with earned income waivers, rental waivers, combined with financial literacy training. So when local residents fulfill their career ambitions, don't immediately have increased rents and mixed affordable housing for up to three years to save, earn, and potentially buy to retain families. Thank you. Uh, final thoughts, the master plan proposed by the Council Breeden allows our community to be more welcoming, culturally dynamic, and potentially streamline assets in a neighborhood where you can walk, shop, work, play, live. Thank you very much, Council Wu, Council Breeden. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, next up, Diane Klein, followed by Karen Smith, Bruce Klein, Michelle Duvall, 
Eileen, and then that's all I have in terms of people who have raised their hand to speak. So we'll do one pass through at that point if anyone else um, would like to join public testimony after that. Diane. Hi, hello. My name is Diane Klein. Um, as a board member of the Brighton Alston Historical Society and co-chair of the Preservation Committee, I would like to testify on the importance of preservation in our community. Members of the Historical Society consider demolition part of a disturbing trend, gradually changing the historic fabric of our neighborhood. Over the past few years, the Preservation Committee has been writing to the Landmarks Commissioners more and more frequently to express our concern over the demolition of older homes in our neighborhood. When developers request the demolition of a beautiful Queen Anne or shingle style home, they frequently propose to replace it with a large apartment building. This not only reduces the historic fabric in our neighborhoods, but it is usually accompanied by the loss of green of trees and green space as these new larger buildings are built close to the property edge in order to maximize the number of units they can accommodate. The architecture of these new structures does not complement the design of the existing older homes and changes the character of the street. Instead of demolition, we request developers to consider additions in the back of the property if that's possible. Even if they are sometimes in less than pristine condition, demolishing these older homes and replacing them with denser and larger structures is of great concern. We understand that no neighborhood stands still and inevitably evolves over time, but we believe that new growth can be better accommodated through developing sites such as the former rail yards or the Boston Landing site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Karen? Hello, thank you, Councillor Wu, Councillor Breeden, and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to have one more chance to advocate for a master plan for Alston Brighton. Uh, this is not the first time, but I hope that this is successful. And, and in a word, I support what others have said, but this is not just a nice to have uh, desire. We need a master plan. We have the evidence that what we're doing so far has okay. failed. We wow. really need a master plan. And the evidence is that we are not having uh, the improvements in home ownership percentage. We're not having the increase in affordability that we need. Every day that we don't have this, we are falling further behind. So I didn't tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm Karen Smith. You see my name on the board. I've lived in Alston Brighton my entire life. I'm a homeowner now. I rented as a younger person, lived here with my family, have raised my own family here, have been active in many community events and uh, activities and initiatives over the years. And currently I'm on the board of McNamara House, so I'm feeling quite attuned to the needs of our older residents and echo much of what has been said about the need and the desire for people to age in community and stay here and have it be safe and wonderful and not another time of anxiety in life. I will submit written testimony and just focus on a few points here again because so many wonderful points have been made about why we need this master plan. And I do want to say that I fear that what has made Alston Brighton so special is eroding. And this has been a community that throughout my whole life I've seen it be a place where people can stay and yet remains open and welcoming to many new people across the range of incomes, where they come from, how long they want to stay here, why they're in Alston Brighton. And there's always been some way for people to belong and participate. And as I see the results of the development, this onslaught, that really seems to be eroding again, day by day, project by project. And not for lack of goodwill and trying by talented BPDA staff, but all these individual plans, they're not coordinated, they're not integrated. And it's not based in the people who live here, which is the greatest resource. I just want to point out the number of people that are attending this hearing, and it's been alluded to, but I want to make it more concrete what it means to live in this neighborhood and advocate for it. I think many of the people that you've heard from here today, many who are probably listening and not speaking, many who would like to but couldn't attend, spend countless hours. When I think about community people who spend anywhere from five to 20 and more than that for some, 
doing community volunteer work to protect and preserve our community, to let it thrive and prosper. That's a pretty astounding commitment. And yet we're still feeling that we're failing and we need more help from the master mm -hmm. plan to preserve it. There are three principles for this. I will put them in my writing. One is it's protecting the attributes that make Alston bright and successful. Allow people to remain and stay active. An example, if we don't put sufficient buffer zones- Gary, I'm sorry, we're over time. Could you wrap up? Sure. Thank we you. will lose the attributes of people who have stayed here and want to stay here. Cover the spectrum of affordability. As you've heard, there are no downsizing opportunities for seniors in this community. And that's just one group. Others need a way to stay here as well. And I want to speak to the community benefits. It was alluded to the fact it's not working. I've been on an IAG. I followed IAGs. We need community benefits for Alston Brighton, not just benefits that are preordained and support entire citywide programs. Uh, this is not transparent. And if you're gonna be on an IAG and try and put in the good work to protect the community and get support for the community, those benefits need to make all the things that surround good housing work and prosper. And that needs serious attention in the development of housing. We need authentic civic engagement and we need public processes that support that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please, I'm so sorry to keep cutting, cutting everyone off with the time limit. If if you are able to email the, um, if you had prepared remarks and would like to email them to us so the counselors can make sure it's entered into the full record, um, please make sure to do that. And we will attach it to the um, full re public record of this hearing as well. Okay, next up, Bruce Klein, Michelle Duval, Eileen, and then DB Reef. There you go, Bruce. Um, hi, I'm Bruce Klein. I've been a uh, resident in Austin Brighton for uh, about 43 years now. And I've been very active in community organizations such as the BAIA, the BC Task Force, uh, the ACA, and uh, many other opportunities have arisen to make this a wonderful area. And I'd like to keep it that way. I, I agree with almost everything that everybody has said about affordability and housing. I'd like to bring up another point that we really need a master plan. Uh, and, and within this master plan, I'd like to see some consideration for, for green space being taken care of. It seems like every development brings its uh, housing, its, its buildings up to the sidewalk. This isn't a good thing. We lose the front and side zoning setbacks frequently. Uh, a house that has a yard uh, and some trees around it make it desirable for families, and this is rapidly disappearing. The corridor approach is fine for the corridor, but the impact of the surrounding area and it has been ignored. We need to make these areas conform with the with neighborhood. neighborhood. And uh, we haven't seen that happen. We need more permeability. We need some of these open surfaces to be allowing water to drain out. The, uh, the possibilities are endless, but we need to save the resources that make Brighton and Alston such a great place. The river is constantly being threatened by increased development, uh, and we need to place permeability, drainage, and other items regarding the production of oxygen by natural resources to be allowed. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Councillor Reardon and the Boston City Council for allowing me this opportunity. My name is Michelle Duval, and I am the director of the adult education program at the Gardner Pilot Academy, a full service community hub school in Alston, whose mission is to provide learning and social opportunities as well as health and other community services. Our adult education program, in which we teach adult residents of Alston Brighton English as a second language, is part of Gardner's extended service programs to realize the mission and vision of the school. Our seven ESOL classes classes range in level from literacy to advance. We serve approximately 100 adult learners from over 15 countries ranging in age from 18 to 75. With adult education 
levels varying from none to advanced degrees. We also run an English for Entrepreneurs class to help immigrant business owners improve their language and business skills. Our purpose is also to connect all of our students, regardless of immigration status, to a variety of community resources, including housing, health care, food, and immigration services. Due to a lack of community resources, we historically have had a one to two year wait list of 70 to 80 community residents. We are also aware of gaps in access to workforce development programs due to legal status. As of 2015, approximately one-third of Alston residents were immigrants. These immigrants play a large role in the economic viability of our neighborhood. Adult learners are an essential part of the community, which strengthens itself. <clears throat> excuse me, which strengthens itself by supporting and promoting adult education. To this end, the Alston Brighton Adult Education Coalition, of which Gardner is a lead member, works to ensure continuing educational opportunities to our neighborhoods. According to the National Coalition for Literacy, better English skills improve the welfare of both children and their families and lower the rates of chronic disease and reduce hospital visits. Therefore, supporting adult education and its learners is life transforming support. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Michelle. Eileen? Hi, uh, thank you very much, Council Wu and Council Breeden for having this hearing. Um, I'm Eileen Huben. I've lived on Cory Road for 44 years last month. Um, we have a house, although I grew up in apartments. Um, I've been on the board of the homeowners union. I've been somewhat active in back and I'm part of the Cory Hill Neighborhood Association. We are on the Brookline border um, which means we are the orphan of an orphan neighborhood. <laughs> Alston Brighton is often called an orf orphan neighborhood. We seem to be disjointed from other people in Boston understanding us. I appreciate all the things I've heard at this hearing. I've learned a lot. I agree with about 98% of all the things that have been said as being important. I'll try to bring up a couple of things that weren't mentioned. Um, I wish this uh, impetus had been about 10 years ago before the tsunami of development began because that's when it needed it to put the cart uh, instead of putting the cart before the horse. Um, about 120 years ago when the streetcar lines were put out to the streetcar suburbs of Brookline, Alston, Brighton and Watertown, um, the infrastructure was put in first. First you had the streetcars then you had the development, which also included planning for little um, retail sections of the neighborhood for needs of the neighborhood to be dealt with. So you had the infrastructure first and then that. Here we've had the mobility study after most of a large amount of development, and again, this after. The last zoning that was done for this neighborhood, the last major zoning, and there's been revi revisions, well, it may have been more than 30 years ago, it was a very careful effort of citizens and BRA staff and city staff, and I believe they had some urban planners to prevent, after some development in the 70s and 80s, to prevent exactly what we're facing now. Thank you. If the hearing had been observed, then I think we wouldn't be in as much of a crisis as we are now. Um, Variances have been given on all the large projects and PDAs allowed where um, giving variances for the allowed reasons would, would not have happened because they weren't allowed reasons and um, it would have slowed down the development. Thank you, Eileen. Several economic um, cycles and we have an overheated real estate market where Families who go to who actually could afford to buy a house go to buy a house, and even if they have cash, they're they're competing against developers and investors 
with who want to buy for cash and they can't compete even if they don't. And most of them obviously have an approved mortgage, but that doesn't compete against these cash buyers who are overpaying. Um, Thank you, Eileen, could I ask you to wrap up, please? I'm sorry. Sorry, my granddaughter's in the background. Um, so I lost my train of thought one second. Um, we need to have incentives from the city that will make it worthwhile for developers and also the funding that they claim they can get, for example, for condos, um, to be in, to incentivize having the funding for condos, for homes, for townhouses, for lower, for renovating the existing housing stock that needs renovation instead of replacing it. And these are the kinds of um, things we need for housing in order to have or go back toward what Austin and Brighton was once the affordable area of the surrounding and people who couldn't afford to go there could afford here. For the last 10 years, that's no longer been the case. And we need to work to incentivize um, the, um, I forget the initials, but having the percents of affordable, supposedly affordable housing is a Band-Aid. And we need to incentivize having housing that really is affordable for the people and their earning and the, um, the uh, what you earn a year, um, your incomes and what the actual incomes are in this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Um, DB will be followed by Michael Kane and then Kotomori. Oh, DB, you're muted. Hi, everyone. And thank you, uh, Councillor Breeden, for calling for this hearing, Councillor Wu, and all the other councillors who have participated. I'd like to address the issue of housing through two policy lenses. Uh, one is planning and one is taxation. The first experience I had with the then BRA was the long, painful process of the Boston College Master Plan. Uh, you know, in the end, I'm not sure how many acres of green space uh, were destroyed for uh, baseball stadiums. Uh, and the selling point of that plan was that they would house 95% of their students, and it included building a dormitory on the old baseball field. That dormitory was never built. There's a football thing there now. Uh, and then the most recent experience I had was the largest development in Austin Brighton, the stop and shop development for um, tall buildings. Um, the first one was all rental, no home ownership, and zero affordability. The second was offices, so you might say that was zero affordability, and that was phase one. And then in phase, in phase two, the third and fourth buildings would be built with maybe they said 18%. I asked the question, are they obliged to build those buildings with that level of affordability? And of course, there was no answer because they're not. And so my First policy suggestion is developers are obliged to build what they say they will build to get uh, approval. And then um, my, the taxation issue I'd like to address is uh, there was is a very large house on Lake Street. In fact, it was owned by the man who named Chandler Pond, Mr. Chandler. Uh, the homeowner moved to, but did not sell it. He rented out 10 bedrooms at $1,000 each, so that's $10,000 a month revenue. But his, he, that building was still taxed as residential. When it, and many, many, many buildings in Austin, Brighton, and the city, there are business investments. They should be taxed at the business rate. And I think that will make them less attractive as investments. Uh, and then also on Lake Street, recently, uh, Another very large uh, house, I think it has 10 bedrooms also, it was sold, for, oh, by the way, that first one was sold for a huge price, I don't know how much, but the next one I'm talking about was sold for more than $2 million and bought by a wealthy couple who had, who has formed a 501c3 for autistic children, and I applaud the cause. This is not about that cause at all. Thank you, but by buying it for their 501c3, they took it off the tax rules. 
And that's something else that affects Alston Brighton. Houses are being taken off the tax rolls, and that takes that house out of the housing stock, another house where families could have lived but haven't. And thank you for my extra seconds. And thank you again. Thank you. Michael? Great. Thank you, uh, Councillor. And uh, thank you, Councillor Breeden, for uh, inviting me to speak on the expiring use uh, subsidized housing dimension. Um, and uh, my organization is the Mass Alliance of HUD Tenants. We're a tenant union. We have uh, current current groups at Reservoir Towers, Warren Hall, and uh, Babcock Towers. Uh, but over the last 20-some uh, years, um, uh, in the city, we've saved about 8,000 8, units, one building at a time, but we've lost 2,300, and more than a fourth of them are in Brighton. Brighton has by far the largest number of lost units. A total of 650 uh, previously subsidized apartments have been converted to market. Uh, I don't have time to go through the list, but uh, uh, currently uh, we just won a 10-year extension at Reservoir Towers for 145 seniors, but that's a building that's mixed with market rate, mostly students, mostly uh, graduate students from other countries. And uh, there was a real risk, there still is, that that will be converted to student housing down the road. That is happening already at Babcock Towers. We have lost that building, 160 units. There is an immediate need, though, to um, protect people from displacement. The BHA has agreed to provide vouchers on a priority basis to about 80 seniors, elderly people in their 80s, that are facing displacement within a year. Uh, and the same at uh, Warren Hall. So that's something that the council uh, could help us with, uh, work with the BHA to make that happen. Um, the other thing, we've uh, been fighting to get more resources to build new housing that is truly affordable. Uh, we've worked with the uh, Austin Brighton CDC on getting, and the council on getting the city rent subsidy program established. There are currently 250 low income rent subsidies available for tax credit or IDP buildings that are in the pipeline. Um, and we would ask the, B, the BPDA, if they're not already, to work with those developers in the pipeline to increase the number of units that are really affordable to people that need it, as we've heard throughout this hearing, uh, it's 250. Second, the council can work with the mayor to increase the city subsidy beyond 5 million a year. Why not go higher? The city is getting four, a $400 million windfall from the feds. Use a portion of that to meet these affordable housing needs by increasing the city's subsidy that you can control. Third point, uh, that right now the city's uh, a voucher program pays what's called the small area fair market rent, which is the true market rent. Um, I, it's quite likely that a lot of these pipeline developments, the 2,400 to 3,000 that Jason mentioned, will be charging rents that are within the range of, this, of the current vouchers. We, we should be demanding that they do a set aside for those to, to reach more people in the community that need uh, mixed income housing and pause the luxury development, step back and pause it until the resources can be assembled to make the housing and the remaining parcels truly affordable for mixed income needs in Brighton uh, and looking to the federal money, which is about to be very uh, radically increased in the next six months. Uh, you put that together, we should pause the whole thing and really come up with a master plan that meets truly affordable needs uh, in uh, Charles View or Ten City type mixed income housing and all the remaining parcels. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ed Kodomori. And Ed's the last one on our list um, in terms of folks who are raising their hands. I'll do one last call. If anyone who is watching would like to testify, if you please click, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click the raise hand button and then I'll see it and uh, we can close out testimony that way. And Hi, my name's Ed Cardamori. I've been in Alston. Well, let's put it this way. My family has been in Alston through five generations. We have seen all the changes from early 1900s to, to now. And what I have seen, what I have heard today is the beginning, obviously, of a master plan. All the thoughts all the ideas are there. 
And the only thing that bothers me is that we will not have a united front with all of the community. I have seen it time and time again. We have failed because we have not united. I've heard Brighton does this, Alston does this. No, we have to have a united front with both in order to get anything done. Now, if they could do it, or is it, uh, was it Suffolk Downs where um, Edwards did it? Why can't we do it here? She has already expressed to us some of the things that she has run into. But I'll bet you that the way she got it done was everybody united. Everybody sought to listen to, pulled together, and made it possible to have a master plan that works for everybody. I'm, I'm hoping that we in this area can listen more into the plans that, or not the plans, but the way um, Councilor Edwards did this. I'm sure that Alston as Brighton has gone through all of it but they don't recognize it because nobody has put it together. They've been too busy dividing each other, yelling at each other, instead of trying to get things done. If we can do that, then we're gonna be successful. If we can't do that, then we are going to fail. So, Councilor Braden, I'm 100% behind you. I hope all of the community will put their thoughts and ideas together as they have together today, and we put to a master plan. Believe me, a master plan has already been written <laughs> five to ten times in this area, but it was never united. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. I think that is everyone. I don't see any other hands up. Um, Michael, is this to speak again or to just from before that your yellow hand up? Oh, okay. Got it. Wonderful. So, um, oh, hold on. One more hand. Uh, I don't, okay. I think everyone who's... Um, wanted to speak, has spoken, and um, thank you very much. I'll go to Councilor Braden for a closing statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A huge thank you to everyone who's participated this morning, our colleagues from the BPDA and DND, uh, all the panelists and all the folks who've taken time to come on and give us their thoughts on the future of of Alston Brighton and the need for a master plan. Um, I think uh, really the, the takeaway message for me is that we need an integrated comprehensive master plan to take into account housing, green space, climate resiliency, affordability, workforce development, schools, food access. You know, planning is more than just about zoning which dictates height and density. Planning is about envisioning a community that is inclusive, diverse, and a, and a great place to live, to raise a family, to grow old, to work, to come to school. And uh, I really hope that we can move this process forward and have a comprehensive master plan and a community-driven comprehensive master plan for Alston Brighton. This is the first of many conversations. I, I hope that we will continue to engage in this process. And I want to thank Councillor Wu for her support today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Braden, and thank you to everyone who came in and testified and spoke with us. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. And oh, sorry, one one last note. We have some video testimony. I nearly forgot. Thank you so much to Carrie uh, from Central Staff for reminding us. So we can go to video testimony at this point. I'm sorry, and then we will. Uh, thank you, Councilor Braden, for the um, from my part um, premature closing. But we'll do that, and then we will adjourn this hearing.
Hello, my name is Siobhan McHugh. I live in the Oak Square area of Brighton. Childcare provider. I have been providing childcare for 24 years. When I started out, we had so many small business owners doing childcare. And now it's, the business is diminished. It not many more opening up childcares. And it's very important for the city to realize that family childcare is vital to families staying in the city of Boston. So we need to continue to show support for women who are sitting, setting up their business and re-establishing the business as a whole. Thank so you. families get adequate childcare while their children are small. Thank you very much, bye. I'm just Hello, my name is Jasmine and I'm a high school age resident of Alston Brighton as well as a member of Boston's Mayor's Youth Council and I'm standing here today to say that I strongly support um, the zoning initiative for Alston Brighton because I think it will be an immensely important aspect, asset in uh, amplifying youth voices and allowing youth input to reach the brainstorming and decision making tables before kind of buildings and developments just start popping up. and. Youth perspectives are immensely important, right? Because they, youth are, youth and young people are ultimately the future of the community and they also grow up around all of these developments. So they should have a say in what their life looks like in the future. And speaking from someone who grew up in Alston Brighton, it's always been kind of frustrating because I feel like there's a blanket statement and stereotype that Alston is just a community of college age students and renters and there aren't really many kids who grow up here but in reality there is a significant population of um, families and young people who do grow up here and I feel like we haven't really always been at the top of the priority list um, of having our perspectives heard and one of these examples is um, the frustration of me and my friends when we were seeing the proposed um, Union Twist marijuana dispensary and what's really frustrating is that as a student we know that where that proposed marijuana pot shop is going to be is where a lot of BPS elementary school um, and high school students wait for the bus together and so that has always been kind of a really large frustration for me and some of my friends that grew up here because we just don't feel like our opinions have really reached the table and have been valued at all. And so I think as a youth president, I just really stand behind this initiative because I think it's something that I kind of wish I had before and will be really empowering for young people in Alston Brighton. And especially for young people who, like me, might be the only English speakers in their families and kind of the representatives um, regarding families um, who may be growing up in Austin Brighton. So thank you for your time today and have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman Wu, Councilor Braden, and other members of the Planning, Development, and Transportation Committee. My name is Justin Brown, and I've lived in Brighton for the past 22 years. Three years ago, I co-founded the Austin Brighton Node of 350 Mass, a statewide climate justice organization. Though this list is not exhaustive, I'll take the chance here to speak about three things, what we can include, what we can undo, and how we can think. First, a master plan must include all the ways that we can meet our collective needs while living within the ecological limits of our bioregion. This means targeting a severe reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, increasing green space, and providing healthy, resilient, and affordable housing. I would like to see continued emphasis on multimodal transit planning for our region's corridors that emphasizes walkability, biking, and easy access to mass transit. I'd also advocate for the primacy of the Charles River in our planning decisions. In addition, I see opportunities to create electrical microgrids that would provide opportunities to democratize energy and allow more people, renters especially, to have safer, healthier, and cheaper energy. Secondly, this is a chance to explicitly undo decades of racist policies that have resulted in existing housing patterns and levels of wealth in majority white Austin Brighton. 
left in their own existing power systems will end up producing more of what we already have, segregation and extreme wealth inequalities. You've heard it from many others and I wanna repeat it, true and permanent affordability with a pathway to ownership and wealth accumulation is an integral part of thriving communities. And climate justice cannot be achieved without undoing racist policies that keep historically marginalized people behind. Finally, long-term planning is an opportunity to keep the power and pressure of short-term thinking at bay. If this really is a plan, then it should be a long-term plan. We should be thinking about how the decisions we make now will affect the people of Austin Brighton in 100 years. I propose two ways to do that. The creation of a citizen's, citizen's assembly with legitimate decision-making power and a third party analysis of who has benefited most from development and planning in the last 10 years. This should be people first planning, which means we must explicitly dampen the power of the market. Thank you. Wonderful, okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much to our central staff team for making sure we um, got in that uh, pre-taped and, and very important public testimony as well. Thank you again, Councilor Braden, our lead sponsor, and to everyone who joined us. Um, I will gavel close this hearing on docket number 02, hold on, uh, 0214, a hearing on uh, regarding an Alston Brighton master plan and zoning initiative. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Have everyone. a great day. Thank you, everyone.